All right, guys, why don't we um, get started? So second day, thank you for being here on a Sunday. I know it's not, a, it's not easy, so really appreciate it, thank you. Uh, looks like we are all here, so let's get going. So I was going to um, ask you guys if you have any questions from yesterday uh, that we should go over, um, because I know we covered a lot of things yesterday. So any questions at all? All right. All right, guys, so in our outline, um, right, I just sent you guys the outline also. <coughs> uh, let me bring this up, okay. All right, so we're kind of going, going through, so we actually learned um, uh, cloud overview yesterday, uh, compute engine, uh, storage. Uh, we looked at data studio. Um, so that's where we stopped. Data Studio, right? So Data Studio, as you can imagine, is very powerful. And if you guys come from sort of the, uh, you know, Tableau, you know, Excel world, you will really appreciate how easy it is and also how fast it is, right? For a web-based application, you can just click, 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 and then, you know, it, it'll, you know, it's almost be updated instantly. So that's very well done. Um, sure, and a uh, couple of questions I had. Yes, this class is being recorded, uh, so um, if you, you know, if you missed a few, a few segments, uh, I will definitely send out the recordings afterwards. Yeah. So give us a couple of days so we sort of clean up the video and send it out, right? The um, the skill matrix, uh, question was, where's the skill matrix? So it is not sent out using the email because email only sends out the PDF document. So what we've done is um, I uploaded this in the, into your uh, um, class folder, right? So if you guys are all here, I'm hoping you guys are all are. Right? I mean, here's a URL one more time, just to be sure. All right, so. Okay. And then um, come to the uh, class folder. <coughs> and um, yeah, so you and you'll find it there, right? So it's actually a uh, uh, skill matrix. So it's an Excel spreadsheet. So again, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a something we, uh, I mean, I use it myself personally just to kind of say, hey, okay, so what are the skills um, required and you know, where am I lacking, uh, where I should go improve, right? So like a little self-evaluation. Good guys, very good. Um, yes, so recording will be sent out to you guys in a couple of days. Um, any other questions? Is everybody okay, doing okay with the lab environment, Google Cloud, yeah, working okay, yeah. And again, so the only thing I will um, just caution against is like, you know, if you spin up VMs, uh, just kind of shut them down, um, right? So you you know you don't forget about them and leave them running for weeks on weeks. <coughs> okay, dogs. So Data Studio, any questions? We looked at Data Studio yesterday. Uh, very capable, right? And also uh, very fun to use. Graphs and everything, like on, on you know uh, online. And one of the things I, I really like is um, you can easily share. And then you know just like any other Google Doc. You can share with everybody, and you know anybody can come and edit the you know edit the graph. Right, that's that's pretty awesome. Right, just, because it's just like you know any other Google Doc. Right, you can share with anybody. Right. Oh, sorry, this this not mine. Uh, let's see. Uh, <coughs> oh, so I'm gonna reload everything now. Okay, one second. So if you had your own right own day, you know own visualization. Um, oh, looks like I closed mine. Oh, there you go. That's it. Okay. And then, yeah, you can sort of share this with anybody, just like, you know, any, any Google, right? You can give them, you know, uh, read permission, just, you know, write permission, all that. So it's pretty handy, just like any other Google Doc. All right, so that's where we ended up. So I, I gave you guys a couple of tasks just to kind of play around with Data Studio. Um, here is the um, <clears throat> two labs. Uh, again, the data is already, so again, this is what I want to emphasize. Um, for data, you could up to, up, upload your own data and analyze, but we also give you some public data sets available, right? So in case, you know, you're, you're having issues with uh, buckets, just, you know, just use our bucket. You know, as you can see, this is a public bucket for us. And, you know, we have <coughs> all the data important. Yep. All right, guys, that's that. Um, I have a question here. Please go ahead, yeah. So uh, to practice, if I'm looking for large sets of data, what would be some good resources beyond what you shared here? Like, can you think of, like you showed for visualization, 
a data is beautiful is uh, you know a good reddit so similarly yeah. if i'm looking for large data sets what would be some good resources yeah we actually yeah in the, in the next section we are going to do a big query uh, we are going to show you guys uh, so google actually hosts some few large data sets uh, those are a good place to start uh, the reason i recommend them is they are already in the google system so you you're not going to you know uh, incur any cost um, you know reading them or anything right because they're all part of the google ecosystem so start with that and also if you um, if we go to the readme file on the top uh, these are some of the links uh, these are two pretty good repositories you know i use all the time uh, one is called uci so this is uci machine learning repository let me, let me show you guys this so this is like a pretty stable um, data repo for machine learning community <clears throat> it's been around forever i think and also you know you can so sort of look at data sets here and the the cool thing is like you know you can sort of you know, choose like which area you want like for example you want something from i don't know like say social sciences right and then see all the all the data sets they have right or something in healthcare you know what i mean so anyway right so you can sort of you can choose the data that you guys really um um right uh, really comfortable with and you know download and use it yeah so most of the data here is not big uh, it's kind of you know just small to medium size the big data sets, uh, there are two options. So um, you can just do this uh, GCP data sets, right? Uh, public, public data sets, right? And then, so these are data sets Google actually hosts. Let me put this link for you guys here. I'll put this link in the, the doc. Um, okay. So, all right. So this is good. Uh, this is a good place to go because um right and, <clears throat> and not only you can sort of look at them right and uh you can actually even query them using like you know you can actually pull this data into your data studio or in a big query and things like that right so you know how this you know how they write very easy to pull in so let's see let me show you a few things all right again same thing right so Oh, cool. There's some COVID data as well. Okay, interesting. Uh, if you want big data, there's an IRS uh, filing, right? Uh, where was that? Oh, there's a. <laughs> so, yeah, there, a lot of the Bitcoin data is, you know, it's pretty heavy, right? So, you can, you know, there's always, always an idea. Let me go back here. That's it. And financial, financial. Anyway, so, there, where was that? Um, one second. Anyway, I mean, so as you can see, right, there are tons of these here. Um, oh, okay, so this is just a marketing brochure. Anyway, yeah. So yeah, so basically, you know, Google data sets, and if you search for it, you say, then you know, they, they are like a lot of these stored, you know, stored already. So the cool thing is, you know, like I said, it's free because it's already part of the Google ecosystem. You don't have to upload them or anything, right? It's already there. So okay, and we will use a couple of these uh, today. Uh, financial services, yeah, there you go. I think this one is. I will use a couple of these data sets today with BigQuery. Okay, oh, there we go, IRS. That's what I was looking for, All right? So this is basically IRS filings uh, of um, uh, businesses, I believe, All right? So this, this is gonna be a pretty big data sets. Let's see if we show you some sizes. Uh, so, and you know, this is, this is something we're gonna use and it's a pretty decently big data set, All right? So, cool. And we'll use it with the big data. Very good, very good question, right? So because always nice to know uh, where to put, get the data sets. Yeah, exactly. And then um, there you go, uh, Anil posts a link as well. That's pretty good as well. Let me also put this on the link just so you know you guys have everything in the doc. Yeah, thanks. Let's go now, all right. All right. And also, yeah. All right, good guys. Uh, very good. Uh, anything else? Um, any other questions, guys, from yesterday? And um, also, you know, um, I want to mention it's kind kind of hard to balance three time zones, um, right? Uh, I know, you know, uh, we have people you know, pretty much all across the you know, three time zones. So again, thank you so much, uh, especially if you're on the East Coast, right? Because I know it's not the most convenient time. 
Uh, so yeah, I really thank you guys for your patience uh, because we always try to sort of find the middle ground, but uh, it's always hard, right? Especially across three time zones, uh, especially on a weekend. Uh, <laughs> so thank you guys, yeah. Um, so what else? Yeah, uh, and then yeah, as, as you guys mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Kegel data set is pretty good too. So let me see. Um, yeah, All right. So that's UCI I showed you guys, and then uh, uh, Kegel it's also pretty good, um, right? So uh, I think this is sort of the newer data. UCI has been around for a while, so they have like a lot of classic data sets, but a lot of the new data is going to Kegel data repository, right? And you know, you you can see like they are like tons of these data as well. And not only that, um, in Kegel, they also have discussions. Like for example, you know, let's say, I don't know, let's say put COVID challenge, right? And the thing is like, a lot of people like discuss this. Like for example, people say, oh, okay, you know, how did you like, you know, clean the data, you know, I mean, things like that, right? So that is pretty good. So it's not like just, you know, somebody just throw data uh, on a public server. It's actually people are discussing it. So you can learn a few, uh, learn a lot, a lot of things actually, you know, sort of looking at, you know, how people are processing the data. So yeah, I would recommend Kegel wholeheartedly, right? Anyway, so you guys, now you guys know, you know where to go, you know, fetch some data and then uh, kind of download, you know, data as you can see, right? And, and this is a pretty decent data set, you can see, right? It's like 767 meg megabytes. So that's a pretty good data set. Okay, very good guys, very good. So again, I, I, so I put the, all this uh, discussion in the links, right? So this way, you know, you guys have like one document where, you know, all the links are, so. Um, all right, good guys. And I also, it's good to see uh, networking documents. So, uh, so again, I just want to be joined a little later. Um, so what I did was uh, I put a link right here when I'm highlighting is for sort of a networking doc, right? Um, so it's basically, you know, usually when I run these public classes, I set this up because a lot of the time people want to network with each other, right? If you have a similar background, if you work in a similar industry. So it's kind of a you know, good way to kind of, you know, right? And so you just put your name, and your contact, you know, LinkedIn, whatever. Yeah, and I see you guys are already doing this. That's very good. And like your background, right? That's perfect. So anyway, so the link to this doc is here, uh, attendee doc, right? And if you're interested in networking, yeah, please gonna put your name in there as well. All right, good guys. So I think we are ready to go. Any other questions? Okay, so let me, I think, yeah. So let me, so let me Jen, the put a resource here. So let me see what this is. Yep. So, oh yeah, that's cool. Okay, nice. Okay, I'll put this link too. So that's very, very, very good data. Hey, Suji, uh, could we find out if anybody was able to use data from their own bucket and explore? Uh, I just tried once, but my mine was disabled and I don't know. I didn't try the public one, but I, I'm pretty sure that will work, but sure, my own sure. data set was not uh, working. Okay. Uh, I, I tried it. It works fine. Yeah, it worked fine for me. Too. Gotcha. So okay. the um, yeah, the um, so uh, I had some trouble yesterday too. So the thing is, like the the URL you enter, you know what I mean? It has to. They are very finicky about this. Uh, they don't auto complete, so you can type it exactly as it is, right? And one of the mistakes I did yesterday was um, uh, I don't know if I can say this again, but I was kind of typing like this, right? I was kind of like typing uh, delete this. All right. I was kind of typing my URL like this, um, like you know, this is my bucket name and then some my data, but you mm -hmm. know, they didn't like the prefix. So, you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, so the, I know, then yeah. I had to just do like, you know what I mean? So it's like these little things that'll trip you up. Uh, so yeah, just, you know, just say, yeah. Uh, but okay. yeah, usually it works fine. Got um, it, thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's always, I, I always joke, like it's always the small things <laughs> that, uh, that trip you up, yeah. Okay. And instead of uh, typing, do a copy paste. Go to That's the right. bucket, go to the yeah. file. It mm -hmm. has the link, Co yeah, let copy me. that link. Let me show you guys. Yeah, that's actually a very good, very good uh, tip. Yeah. So here's my bucket, right? Let me refresh this so it doesn't time out. All right. So here's my bucket data, right? So here's my file, right? Yeah, that's a great idea. And just simply, right? That's it. All right. Copy this whole thing, and you know, and they even have like a handy thing. See, like a little thing, copy, right? Mm -hmm. So this way, you, you know, you're not making typos or anything, right? So anyway, yeah, that's what I recommend. That's a good tip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't know if you guys noticed this yesterday. Um, uh, Data Studio can only pull in uh, 100 meg, right? That's what the restriction right now. So yesterday I tried to kind of load all these three files and you can see the size, right? 65 meg, you know, they're like around 60 meg each basically. So all three together, uh, they're like, you know, more, more than 100 meg, right? So they said, no, you got too much. So 
basically I had to then load in the individual files. Uh, so that's so, a limitation right now. Um, so what, what is if the, if you got a file leak, which is like a gig in gigs? Right. So right now, I don't think data should be supported. So you have a couple of options. Uh, one of them you can do is um, you can take a sample of the file, right? Okay. So let's say you have in a one gig file, maybe you are, you can do like a ten percent sample. That's you know it's maybe it's, you know it's representative. So at least it will give you some idea of the data, right? Okay. Uh, then you are kind of if you if you are a large file, then you are kind of doing it on your own, as in like you have to stand up your own machine, you know you are doing like either Python or something. Uh, to download, I mean, to, and that's what we are going to look at today, right? Because uh, these built-in ones, uh, they are okay for some small data sets, uh, but for large ones, we can use something called BigQuery that we are going to look at right now. Okay. Uh, so BigQuery is also for for visualization. That's right. So what you can do, okay, that's a good question. So what you can do is uh, <clears throat> when your data sets um, when your data set uh, happens, you can actually source data. Let me let me actually go to one of these. Um, this, no. Data Studio. All right. So, when you create a report, see how the data source comes in. So you can actually connect from BigQuery. Okay. What do I mean by that is, so kind of you can do like this, right? So, so kind of the way you had seen it's like yesterday. What we did is like we did the raw data, right? Um, from Google bucket, sorry, I'm typing, yeah, into Data Studio, right? This is what we did yesterday. So now, today what we're gonna do, we're gonna do the raw data from bucket. Uh, it's gonna go through BigQuery, and then you can find it through Data Studio, right? Because BigQuery, which we're gonna look at today, is going it, it can handle pretty much any data you throw at it, right? So you can use this to either like, you know, maybe only select the data you're interested in, right? So maybe, you know, if let's say this data, you have 10 gig worth of data here, maybe out of the 10 gig, only a small section is interest of, in industry, right? Then you can use BigQuery to sort of filter that and then feed that in your data studio, yeah? So yeah, you, you can do some pretty smart things here. Uh, let me see if I had a lab on this one, I thought I did. Um, Let's get you in. Yeah, no, that's not that one. Okay, so, all right, actually we'll do BigQuery today and then I'll show you guys, right, from how to feed that in. Cool, is that right? So that, that's one popular approach. Okay. So G, what was the limit again on? Uh, 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 100, 100 meg, yeah, 100 meg. Okay. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. So, um, I don't know if they have any plans to update this. Um, I, 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 again, you know, you know, in Google, like, you know, they don't announce any plans, so, right, so, yeah. All right, guys, very good questions. Um, let's see. <clears throat> uh, question is, how do you manage security and permissions on the reports? Sure, right? So treat it like any other Google Doc. So, okay, let me let me actually close this. We don't need that. Um, so let's say I have, you know, ah, oh, should, I, should I post that? Anyway, so we are a record. So if you go to the, the, you know, just like any Google Doc, you'll see the share permission, right? And then, you can go to advanced and sort of, you know, again, you know, again, you know, this is not my doc, so you know, I don't have permission, but you just got the idea, right? Actually, let me show you guys here. Okay, this is my doc. So here's a share permission, right? And then here you can go and sort of say, okay, right? So right now, this is this is the class node. So I have set as like, anyone who has the link can view this, right? And you can go and change this to, you know, like you can say, oh, you know what? I just want only a lot of specific people or, you know, just elephantscale.com, you know, your domain or whatever, right? So yeah, yeah, uh, the, the permissions are very flexible. Mm -hmm. So the Google, this is the standard Google, Google Docs permissions. Yep. All right, good guys, very good. Uh, let's see. Okay, so let's go on to. Um, okay, let's, let me close all this. All right, so we are doing collab. Actually, big. Actually, let me do a big query real quick. No. Oh, oops. All right. Is it this? Okay. <laughs> Looks like somebody overwrote my slides. All right. Uh, <laughs> sorry about this, guys. So if you look at a BigQuery slides, uh, it's like an empty slide. So 
looks like somebody merged and overwrote my slide. Okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, let me do this. Um, I will dig up the right slide and send it to you guys later. But for now, um, I'm gonna show you guys BigQuery and then we'll uh, do, the, do the lab as well, right? Uh, so sorry about this. I think if you look at the BigQuery slide, the one you I guess have, it's, um, right, it's not, you know, it's like a blank slide. So it looks like, you know, some, in time somebody tried to do a merge, they kind of overwrote my changes. Anyway, so uh, don't worry about this, I'll, I'll send you the right one uh, after the class. So can you guys all come to the BigQuery um, page right here? I will walk you guys through this. So here's the link. I'll put this to everybody. So here's the BigQuery page. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to improvise and I'm going to, um, I'm going to walk you through the doc real quick. And then, and then we'll do the lab. And lab, you'll see, BigQuery is so easy to use. I just want to highlight a few things, right? So. All righty. All right, guys, everybody on the BigQuery page? Yeah. So. But how, okay. how did you get there? Oh, the, the, so the link is on the Zoom window, please. Yeah. So. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what is BigQuery? It's in a very simple terms. It's, um, it's using uh, SQL to query large uh, amount of data, right? So think about this way. Let me get a draw something here. Um, okay. So imagine you have tons of data in your Google bucket. Right, and so usually what people want to do, people want to just you know just query the data. And SQL is you know the standard language because everybody knows SQL. So, but how do we query the data in SQL? So, can you guys tell me? Let's say I have some data, and I want to run SQL queries. Like, what are what are some of the choices you guys know of? Right, so I want you make make a connection. I'm not sorry. I, no, I don't think about Google in, in particular. Just you know, I mean, you know, a, a, any other option. Like you know, I, let's say I want to do some SQL query right now. You know, what do we do? T9 uh, AWS. Yeah, yeah. So for example, uh, if you're doing AWS, um, you can do. Um, uh, so let me start with the simple one, right? Let's say you know you're doing on premise, you just put it in a database, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll upload the data into a database, and then we you know we can you know we can do SQL query you know, on the database. That, that's a standard option, right? What if the data is really large, right? Databases can handle up to sort of, you know, up to medium, like a few hundred gigs of data. But what if we go beyond that? Then what are my choices? Hive. Right, so if you're using Hadoop, right? Um, then Hive is a pretty good choice. Hadoop, uh, so Hive, right? Um, and also if you think about also Spark, right? So th now we are sort of going into the big data territory, right? So this is, this is option one, right, two. Um, and we look at Spark later today. Sorry, uh, what, what yeah, was that? Amazon has uh, Athena, which goes right. directly against S3. Exactly, right? So basically, AWS, um, Athena, uh, Redshift, all these guys, right? Athena, Redshift, right? All this. So, and the Google, Google's answer to that is BigQuery, right? So what BigQuery and you know, all these guys are kind of trying to do is like, you know, they, these, all these guys are in the same league, right? Uh, they are designed to do very large scale data uh, and query them using SQL, right? So, and you guys will see like, you know, these, these are not designed for like all TP, like, you know, like, you know, as in like, you know, um, sub-second response time or millisecond response time. This is more like all app, right? That, that's kind of the, the, in the market these guys are addressing. Right, but databases can do or in all TV, you know, in real time. Uh, but these guys are more like all app. Is that gonna make sense? Yeah. So, so I, I always you know bring this up so because we always need to understand the big picture, right? You know, what's the use case we are solving? The use case we are solving right now is we have a lot, a lot of data, and we want to query them using SQL. And you know, so this is kind of the two choices, right? Basically, if you are on, on, on if you're doing like on premise, you probably use Hadoop, Hive, or Spark. On the cloud solution, and every cloud vendor has their own version, right? Amazon has Athena and Redshift, uh, Google has BigQuery, and they also have something called Spanner, right? We'll talk about that, right? So, okay. All right, guys, so that's good. So we, we understand sort of the landscape, right? What we are trying to solve, good. All right. So let's go back to BigQuery. So one of the cool things about BigQuery is this, it's serverless, 
So you, so, and, and there's a lot of <clears throat> going on here because imagine this, imagine you want to query a data. We don't, you know, we don't need to spin up a machine and all this. We simply just go to the console and write the big query. Google behind the scenes uh, handles, you know, spinning up servers and everything. Uh, that's the video of the whole thing. Right? So, and this really is simple because, you know, you don't have to do basically any maintenance at all. Just upload the data and then go to the, you know, big query console and query, right? So no servers. So highly scalable because, you know, like I said, you know, it can scale to any amount of data. And the reason they're cost effective, and you know, we'll look at the pricing model in a second, um, because, you know, like I said, you know, you're not doing any maintenance. I just throw the data on and then run the queries. And then you, you, you basically get charged for the query and then how much data you're accessing, all right? So, and you can sort of see here, right, how they scale, all right? Gigabytes to petabytes. And this is another cool thing about BigQuery is like, and when you go to the lab, you will see how fast it is. It's pretty amazingly fast. And we'll see why, you know, uh, I know, I know uh, why that is, that, that's so. And you know, they support, you know, standard answer SQL. Okay. That's very good. And so, you know, they're kind of saying, you know, right? They're kind of saying, you know, hey, this, this is the you know, idea, right? They're kind of trying to be your data warehouse. All right, so. Um, so, the, um, on top of BigQuery, right? They are kind of building like things like machine learning models, right? And also, you know, we are like BI engine, right? For example, you know, you can now, you know, feed data to any, any of BI, BI engine, for example, right? So they are kind of pushing studio, right? But, you know, you can basically push your BigQuery results into any BI engine. Like, you know, let's say you want to maybe push it to Tableau or, you know, ClickView, you know, any of these guys, right? Or even maybe Google spreadsheets, right? So, yeah, very, very flexible, okay? All right, so let me show you guys this one. Uh, let's look at some of the pricing. So let me do all features real quick. Yeah. All right. So we talked to serverless, right? Automatic, so meaning, so there's another thing that, that, that it's called automatic high availability, music, meaning when your query is running, uh, the way the Google has implemented this is like this. Um, so we, we, we get that. So let me kind of erase this. And so let's say your data is here, right? And I'm running a SQL query from a console. So what happens is Google actually running like a big query server farm constantly all the time. So, and then, you know, some of these, some of these machines are working, some of them are idle. So when you run your big query, the, you know, machines that, that have capacity will immediately accept your query and will start running your query, right? And let's say, you know, as your query is running, let's say your query is, you know, and if your query is like simple enough, it finishes in like a few seconds, you're done, right? And then, and these machines will keep running and the next query comes in, you know, it'll take the, you know, right, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be, it land, land in this machine, so on and so forth. But what if let's say your query is running for like in a long time, it's running for an hour. So what Google will realize is like, hey, this query is running longer, it can maybe benefit from extra horsepower. So they will automatically spin up some machines, right? And then also parallelize your query dynamically. Pretty neat, right? So. If your query is taking longer and they figure out, hey, you know, we, we need more compute power, they, you know, they spin the machines. And as, now you guys know, this is all done by the Google Compute Engine, right? But, you know, we don't get to see this. This is completely hidden behind us, uh, behind the scenes. And all, I, all, I, all I'm doing is, you know, I'm sitting here, right, running my query. That's it. Excuse me? But yeah. you can write, write a ro wrong join. <laughs> Yeah. That's right. So yeah, yeah, you can make, uh, so it's SQL, right? So we can make all the classic mistakes of uh, the SQL, right? Yeah. Um, they have one of the query parser. Uh, I use it once. It'll kind of look at your query and also make recommendation. It will say things like, oh, you know, maybe if you can you know, do this, you know, where close first, you know, it'll cut down the data or something like that. So, you know, it's, it can do some optimizations, but you know, as you know, right, SQL, you can always write a, you know, write a badly performing query. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, they have a built-in optimizer that's pretty decent, but sometimes you can still fool that. So does uh, Google charge you per query, or, or is it? That's right, exactly. So now, as you can imagine, so so as you can imagine, right? When when you do this, right? Uh, there's a lot of assets being used in the behind the scene. So how do they charge? So let's look at our pricing. So, but by the way, before we go to that, you just you just understand this model, like you know how they you know how the queries are running very fast because they're not so it's very important to understand they are not spinning up machines on the fly the machines are already running, right? So they're kind of not running like a big query server farm. And as you can imagine, right, they, are, they, they, are, you know, they may be serving like thousands or millions of queries from a lot of different customers, right? So they can very easily like, you know, throw SQL onto the machine. So the machines are very highly utilized. So, so she, 
What what do you what do you call this feature again? You call it. Uh, you mean there's a so this is called serverless, right? Serverless, okay. Serverless because it can look like this. Look, like I'm here. I'm on my system, SQL console, and then imagine there's like a big curtain, right? I like I don't see anything beyond that, right? I just write my SQL query, and then maybe after you know after like five seconds, I get the results back, right? All this happening behind the scenes, I don't get to see that, but I know they are happening, right? Okay. Yeah. Just for clarification, we're talking about uh, select statements. We're not talking about like a, a delete query or an update query on a very large data set. Right. Uh, yeah, good question. More, yeah, that's a great question. Most of the SQLs you are going to be doing here is mostly read, like reads and selects, right? Uh, you, Google does support updates and deletes, but you know, in a very limited fashion, right? So not, don't think like a database. You can update records and delete records like a database. Uh, there are some limited limited um, SQL semantic supported, but most of the queries here, you're right, is going to be select statements. Yeah, queries. Is mm -hmm. there indexing? Uh... Yeah, actually, they do the indexing for you, right? Okay. Yeah. So that, and that's the beauty of the whole thing. So this is this is my bucket, right? So this is my bucket, right? So I know. So to me, as well as I know, like you know, I know you know, right? I know this, right? So I upload the data here, and then I query the data here. Like what goes on in the middle? Right, I'm pretty much oblivious to this. Yeah. And this is where the sort of the sort of so-called magic happens, right? They really have done a lot of work here to make the queries run very, very fast. Now, uh, are they running Spark programs behind the scenes or do we have any visibility into that? No, I mean, I, um, good question. I very much doubt it because uh, even though Spark is very popular open source, uh, Google had, you know, the internal version of Spark long before anybody did. Right, so I'm guessing they're kind of running the, one of the internal internal systems, not Spark as in like as we know it. Yeah, mm -hmm. huh? yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Oh. Because um, and and you know and one thing like um, so you know, as you know you know the history of Hadoop uh, is uh, so Hadoop was created from a Google white paper, right? So Google built the system, but they didn't open source the system. They just wrote a white paper. They said, hey, this is how, how we built it, right? And Hadoop was then implemented using the the concepts in the white paper, and then kind of you know people figured out okay okay how to do this how to do that. Uh, same thing in HPS, right? They published a white paper. They said hey this is how we build a you know you know massive massive NoSQL database, and HPS was, was, was so. And this is what you will see in a lot of the Google. Google will do a lot of white paper, but you know they don't do at least open source. Only the only difference uh, is basically it's called TensorFlow. Have you heard about TensorFlow? So TensorFlow is a machine learning library. They actually released as open source and you know, it became a big, big hit, right? So now we are doing deep learning, uh, the pretty much the popular library is TensorFlow and that came from Google, right? Uh, even then there are rumors like Google has their own version of TensorFlow. <laughs> so, uh, so they're like a public TensorFlow, right? Now which we all use and you know, then Google has their own fork of the TensorFlow that they use internally. And you know, I mean, I don't blame them. I mean, these are very hard programs to write and you know maintain. So I mean, yeah, I mean, that's their advantage, right? So they may not want to open source the whole thing to anybody. So uh, anyhow, uh, so that's kind of the story. Any any other questions on this one, guys? Um, right. So BigQuery, right? So we understand how the BigQuery. So these are called slots, all right? Just like a, like you know, meaning like so so you you know so you get charged based on how many slots your query actually end up using. If your query is small. You know, it's not going to use, you know, it's going to use it like just a couple of slots. But if it's really large, then, you know, it may end up using a lot of slots. And they would even maybe spin up new machines to speed up your query, right? And of course, you know, you're going to get charged for it. So, 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 so let's see. How. So as an org, how do you limit, like, you know, anybody in your org can run any query and... Yeah, people... yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, so, so now you're going to look at pricing. All right, guys, so let me look at price. So you guys are all here, right, in this, in this page. So look at pricing at the bottom. Okay, so um, so here's the kind of right. I mean, it's kind of you know very very short term, right? So so BigQuery charges for storage, right? Inserts, right? You know how often you upload uploading that. So for, for example, you know how much data you already have, right? So yeah, you're gonna get charged for that. And then how often do you update? Because you know the for new, this is new data, right? And also how often do you get query? So okay, right. So that that's the three sort of you know set they use. How much data do you have? How often do you update? And how often do you query? Okay. So you can sort of see here, like, you know, initial loading, like you know, data, data ingest is free, 
because you know, and this is true for the cloud vendors, right? They, they actually will not charge you to bring in data, right? Because they actually want you to bring in data and you know, then, then you know, it's kind of, then you're kind of locked in, right? So on a typical sense, here's a, you know, for storage, right? So, you know, you can see, you know, so like, you know, in a couple of cents per gigabyte, basically, right? So, so storage is the same storage that we used yesterday, right? That's right. That's right. So, so, so actually, yeah. actually, sorry, sorry. This is, this is slightly different because um, when we do uh, storage, there are a couple of ways you can do this. Uh, and this is where the complication comes in. So let me show you guys this. Uh, let me erase this and draw another one. So here's how you can do this. So you can actually store the data in a bucket. This we know by now, how to do that now, right? So this is our, you know, our bucket storage. Also, you can import the data into BigQuery storage as well. So when you do, so when you do this, what they do is they actually index the data, right? And then we query this, right? And then we query this. So this is also, so you have two options. You can either import the data into BigQuery and then, and then when, you, when you do the import, they will index the data for you automatically. Right, so if you're querying a data set a lot of the time, this is what we recommend, right? You, it's almost like importing into a database, right? So imagine, uh, you know, you have some data, you're importing into a database. So database, when you ask you importing, it will actually create indexes and everything. Same thing here. That's one option. Another option is you can actually query data, like we call pass through, right? You can actually query the data directly from, so this query two, query one, right? You can directly data through the bucket. So this will work but may not be as fast as this, right? Because here you're kind of querying raw data. Uh, BigQuery doesn't have indexes or anything to you know, speed up your query. So it does say that you can do inserts as well. So does that up, up, uh, update the bucket as well? They will update here, uh, right? So insert the support here. And then what they will do, they will do like a snap update of the bucket, right? Because remember Google, uh, Google um, uh, uh, buckets are immutable, right? So what they will do is, you know, so whatever inserts you do, they will create a snapshot of the data, right? In the bucket. Mm -hmm. Right, so your data will kind of evolve. Like, so let's say this is your data when it started snapshot one, and then you know, let's say you just a bunch of inserts, inserts and deletes, and they do another snapshot too, right? And the snapshots are the one that's updated to the buckets, right? Because as, as far as the bucket goes, it just looks like you know just regular objects, right? Because you know uh, the BigQuery handles all the all the uh, all the all the modification. Is that gonna make sense? Okay, so this sometimes throws people off. So, you know, storage, when you say storage, right? There are two ways, like, so one is a bucket storage, which we are familiar with, but you can also import data into BigQuery for fast performance. Make sense, any question on this one, right? But let's say, you know, you know, so a lot of the time when you're getting started, we sort of start with this, right? We say, just put the data in a you know, uh, uh, bucket and say, hey, let's just query the bucket, right? Let's see, you know, you know what we want. And once the queries are defined, then we sort of, you know, we will import the data into the BigQuery because as you can see, right? Um, now you're paying for BigQuery storage too. Right? So you start with this, and then once you know which data set you want to bring in, then you want to bring in the data sets to BigQuery. All right, guys, good. Um, so storage, right? And, for, and then, you know, this is streaming. Streaming has like, you know, high, you know, when, you, when you're doing like, let's say you are doing some uh, streaming data and you're inserting into the, you know, into BigQuery, you can do that too, and you know that you charge at the state, right? So let's look at query. All right, so there are two models. One is pay as you go, right? And for them, right, they, they charge you, right? It depends on how, so again, when I say terabyte, it's like how much is that your query is touching, right? So when you're doing a query, so imagine you're doing a table scan, right? So you're scanning a lot of data, right? So that, that, that's how they add up the data, how much data you know your query is touching. So five for terabyte. Right, and also they say you know first terabyte is free. Right, anyway, this is pay as you go. So as you run queries, you know you just keep paying for how much data you, you know your queries are, you know, are processed. Other one is called flat rate. Right, so it's kind of like and it's kind of pretty steep. Right, it starts like ten thousand a month. Right, and so what you get is remember you get res five hundred reserved slots. Remember that, you know without slots it's like you no know, these are the these are the machines that you're running your query. Right. So what, you, what they do is like, they say, okay, hey, for this price, you have access to this many slots. So your queries can run like pretty much, you know, without any way, you know, without spending any time waiting, right? And then if you want to, you know, if you want to, you know, if they're spending more slots to accommodate your query, right, then they're kind of charging you more. That make sense, right? 
So two pricing, really. either you pay per query or you pay like a fixed price and that gives you a certain number of slots, access to a certain number of slots, right? And, then, and that's it, right? And, and if you allow Google to spin up more slots, then you pay for that too. So G, I'm curious, I mean, the level of complexity and comparing the cost per terabyte per amount of storage at Google Cloud or AWS, I mean, do the, it feels like these roles, like this necessitates a role of like an ops manager to manage <laughs> the costing, the cost yeah. and everything. Yeah. So the, the joke we, I mean, that's very true. So the joke we say is, um, you know, like whenever somebody is trying to move to cloud, you know, they do, they, they go through all the calculation, right? How much data we have, how much, you know, right? All this and all this. And we come with a monthly number. So okay, they say, okay, this is what I think that's, that's what you're going to pay. But the reality is you always pay like easily 50 to hundred percent more than what, you know, what your calculations show, right? Because there's like all these like little hidden things start adding up, right? Which, you know, you don't account for, right? So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, there are some startups I know, like there are some companies who are trying to do this for you. But here's the thing, right? Even they, they're going to ask you like, okay, how much data you're storing? But then it's very hard to compute how much your query is going to, how much data your query is going to touch, right? Let's say you're doing, you know, a lot of joints, Right, and then so now you're kind of doing table scans, like all over many, many tables. So yeah, it's very hard to predict your, you know, how much data you're going to be using. And uh, you know, and and you know, it's what it is, right? Because uh, they would want to charge you for all the data you're processing, and it's very hard for you to kind of you know um, estimate um, how much data, accurately estimate how much data you're going to be touching in your queries, right? And so, like somebody mentioned, like, you know, yeah, what if somebody goes and writes like, you know, some really bad query that does like some, you know, like joins like 10 tables, right? Yeah, so now, you know, you're paying a lot because now, you know, you're kind of, you know, oh, you're processing huge amounts of data. You know? Yeah, it's true. So, so, you know, I always say cloud, um, right? I mean, this, this is something you had to accept if you want to go to cloud. Basically, we are kind of sacrificing, right? We are, we are taking, um, how do you say, um, uh, uh, um, uh, comfort, as in like, you know, uh, ease of use over pricing, right? A lot of the time, right? Because a lot of the companies, they say, you know what, yeah, that's what we want. We don't want to deal with like managing infrastructure. We just want like easy to use system. Is there a limit uh, on the size of data that they support or, um, I mean, on the, on the pay as you go one? Yeah, so what you can do, like, I mean, so the way sort of you control this is um, when you add users, you give them permission. Like, so remember yesterday you can add user to the project. Uh, one, of the, one of the option is when you add users with BigQuery, you can also limit, right? How, many, how much data per day or something they can use. So, so even if, if some, somebody wrote like a really bad query, you know what I mean? They, you know, they can, you know what I mean? They, they, you, know, you can cap their, right? Cap their um, uh, uh, cost. Yeah. The, the reason I ask is because in AWS Athena, there is, uh, I, can do, I can go only over for certain prior data size. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I cannot go and beyond that I have to write Spark program. Uh, right, right. So here, you know, honestly, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, we use some large data set, like, you know, um, uh, several terabytes uh, in BigQuery. And so the way BigQuery works is like, you know, if you want to do that, you want to import it into BigQuery first, right? Because there they have their own indexing engine uh, that mm -hmm. indexes the data and then it'll query. But of course, you know, of course it's going to cost you, <laughs> but at least, it'll, you know, they can handle the data, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so interesting. So uh, you said Amazon Adina, they, uh, what, what do they have like a hard limit or is it more like a performance reason? Yeah, I don't remember the hard limit. Uh, uh -huh. and I don't know if it is a limit that is imposed by my org. I don't know about that. But uh, oh, there's, there's only like, I have always tried to query on S3 bucket and uh -huh. uh, the, I cannot do it because my uh, file sizes are huge. Uh, right, right. Uh, so even smaller, I've, I've seen that it's not, it's not scalable uh, to what I yeah, yeah. So I have written Spark programs to get the uh, yeah I mean uh, the, yeah that, that that yeah that wouldn't surprise me right because yeah. uh, so and also like when they when they design their system they kind of try to do like this you know sort of the appeal to eighty percent of the people right mm -hmm. so they will say okay hey if it works for eighty for eighty ninety percent of the customers you know that's good enough right. So you you might be an outlier <laughs> that you know they they say okay you know you know we, yeah this is not the use case we actually like you know support right now yeah but BigQuery you know I've been very impressed it's very I mean you guys will do the lab uh, you know in a second and you should see how fast it is it's actually a very well done system uh, uh, and also you know I'll show you guys how to do Spark also this afternoon as well right so yeah uh, you have both options.
So getting back to, uh, uh, I think it was Anil, I'm not sure who asked the question is, if, if you're finding that the cost is becoming prohibitive, do, does it then lead, lead, lead a team to say, oh, let's, let's rethink the design, do some, some further development to, you know, if we invest this much, maybe, et cetera, in, in redesigning, re-engineering the solution, we can reduce the, the cost on that, on that side. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it comes to that. So, I mean, so, I mean, I, so, obviously, if you, from the BigQuery page, if you know, right? so what I've done is like, if you look at the pricing guide, right, you can sort of see here. And as you can see, right, it's kind of, you know, you can see, you get a summary chart, right? It's kind of gets a little complex, right? Because, you know, it's like, like a lot of cases they go over, right? And yeah, so, but here's the thing, though. If you are already invested in Google Cloud, and you, you decide to say, you know what, yeah, BigQuery is our SQL engine. It's very hard to re-architect, you, you know, because at this point you're committed, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, hey, we are gonna use this. And, uh, and so at this point, you know, what you can do is you can sort of, you know, make tweaks to say, okay, you know what we need to, you know, let's not do joins all the time. Maybe what you can do is you can join these tables beforehand and put, you know, put them into another table. You know what I mean? Like you can save the joins, things. So you can do some, some basic update, uh, basic tweaks of your queries so not everybody is like, you know, so this join things we did. Like for example, we had a bunch of tables, everybody was joining all the time. So what you will do is like, we'll actually do a join first and then save it as a, as a, as a, as a, like a flat table, then they can query very easily, right? Do, so, you, do you have options to like cr create like a, like schedule a materialized view equivalent of that? Like what you just said, like run this job every hour, kick out it into a different table, refresh it and you know, kind of, yeah, actually, yeah. So, you know, when we did this, we just did like a manually, like we had like a little, like a little uh, scheduler that will run this, like, you know, hey, like I think we ran like every few hours or something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, now they have a cloud scheduler that might do it for you automatically. Right. So when, when we did this, we just did like a little cron scheduler to kind of kick, kick off a query. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know. it, it, it's also called mart, mart, mart tables mm -hmm. because your queries should not be going against the base tables. So right, you can ro roll them up and create some mark exactly. table. Exactly. Yep. yep. And then your queries, regular report should go against the mark table. That's right. So good point. Let me, let me, yeah, let me kind of do this because uh, if you think about this, let me raise this. So I always look, look at this, right? So here's your raw data, right? Very few people need to query the raw, raw data, right? So what we usually do is like, you know, we actually run, you know, many queries and you'll have like different views or different, you know, or different tables. And these are the tables that get queried a lot. Right. So, so yeah, you're right. Because you don't very rarely you have to go back to the raw data because the raw data, you know, it can be very large and, you know, maybe, you know, you don't need to go through all the data. So what we do is usually, you know, we, we created um, um, uh, different tables and for example, let's say, you know, they're like, like four or five tables and a lot of the queries we noticed were joining these four tables. So then what we did was like, then sort of we did that. We said, you know, yeah, join all these tables and create a you know, flat table as well. Right. And then people just query that. So yeah, so you can do, yeah, you can, you, you definitely have to do something like this, right? Because if you keep going to the raw data, I mean, big, big query will support it, right? I mean, they can, they can process any amount of data, but of course, you know, it's a cost, right? As you zip through this data, you know, terabytes and terabytes of data, your bill just keeps going up. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. So these are some of the techniques you will use. Either, uh, you know, upload data into, you know, um, uh, predefined tables or like join tables, things like that. Mm -hmm. Good guys, very good, right? So I mean, uh, the reason I'm sort of spending time on this one is like, you know, as you guys are going and sort of, you know, designing and architecting solutions, uh, I always believe you should know the big picture, right? I mean, because uh, we're gonna use SQL query, I mean, BigQuery, just SQL, right? I mean, there's not, not a whole lot to do, but you know, th these decisions are important, right? What's the cost? How do you optimize it, right? All these things are important, right? Anyway, so you can look at the pricing guide. Again, like I said, you know, I mean, uh, we've been using cloud for a long time and I always say like, you know, I mean, you can spend, like you can come up with like a, very elaborate spreadsheet of, you know, calculating and whatever number you come, come up with, you're always going to fall short, right? Because there's always something we miss. So, um, but, but here, I mean, I, I don't want to sort of, you know, um, paint a negative picture, but for a lot of companies, right, they look at it this way. All right, they will say, okay, so they might say initially they were spending, let's say, um, I don't know, like, I'm uh, just making this up, uh, 100K a month, uh, right, uh, internally, right? I'm just, I mean, this is pretty conservative, but let's, let's go with that, right? But let's say the Amazon bill is like, you know, 50K a month, right? And 
they may look at and say, okay, you know what? Yes, I mean, yes, this may not be optimal, but it's cheaper than kind of, you know, what we would, you know, what, you know, what we cost if we were doing it ourselves, right? So that's why a lot of the organizations make the choice and say, yeah, you know what? Yes, yes, maybe we are using, we aren't using the cloud as effectively as we could, but still it's saving us money, right? So, yeah. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Good, guys, good. Um, what else I want to highlight? Let's see, let me go back here. Let's see. Cheers. All right. Okay, let me just highlight some of the features. Okay, we'll talk about serverless right now. They do all the cool does all the serverless. So they also improved big, big, big query lately. So let's say you are sort of, you know, you are doing uh, streaming. Yeah, you know, let's say you're, you know, getting data from some, like an IoT device or something like this and you're inserting into BigQuery. So now they have a streaming uh, uh, set which can actually can query uh, data coming in in real time, right? And this is pretty, pretty, pretty recent, recent development. So it's pretty cool too. Uh, let's say you are doing some stock market analytics, right? Uh, usually you kind of care about what the stock price is right now, not like what it was 10 minutes ago. So the BigQuery has a uh, streaming engine that actually, you know, run queries, you know, continuously on the incoming data and update the results, right? So it's, it's called Big, Big Query Streaming. So definitely check it out. Um, so again, you know, high availability from a Big Query is basically, right? You know, they, since they are running on multiple, multiple, multiple machines, even if some machines crash, they will automatically spin up new machines. Right? Again, all this is done by Google. We don't have to do anything. And you know, so this is pretty, pretty important, you know, it's just SQL, right? And also, uh, this, this is kind of, you know, federation and everything you are kind of getting into if you have really massive amount of data, right? And you, you want to kind of, you know, start, you know, uh, federation basically meaning like, you know, usually sharding the data across the organization, right? And also the, the queries are doing this, you know, also being sharded. So again, these are kind of advanced concepts. Uh, kind of do this, you know, only if you have sort of really massive amount of data, like I'm taking petabytes of data and you want to manage them in a more logical manner, right? So. And remember, we talked about storage and compute separation. So same argument as yesterday. Remember um, your data, um, let me bring this up, storage, 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 right? This is what we remember, always remember this. So, um, right, difference between Hadoop and Spa. So Hadoop is basically you know, in this model, meaning your data and processing are on the same machine. Right, they are, this is what we call co-location, meaning like right, data I'm processing are co-located, also data log. But from a Google, Google model is different, right? Google model like storage is separate, computer is separate. Why? Because A, you know, they, you know, they solve the networking problem, right? They built a network which is massive, you know, massively high, you know, high speed network. So you can feed data, right? Even the data are separate, they, you know, that network can actually feed data fast to the compute nodes. And having the separation allows them to scale these things uh, dynamically, right? They can spin up, you know, things on the fly. So it gives them a lot of flexibility from a cl as a cloud vendor, and they, you know, and they, they were able to do this because, you know, you know, they built a really fast network, right? So, so that that's how you know, right? So that's why you know, separate, you know, uh, uh, storage compute. Uh, even though this may seem very anti Hadoop, the reason it works really well is because they have a very very high net high speed network, right? Anyway, right, so just, you know, again, so we understand the concepts, right? So meaning they can scale things very, right? Again, you know, automatic backup and stuff, right? So, you know, when you, when you dump data into BigQuery, right? So, all, you know, right, remember all, all these things, BigQuery will automatically replicate data. And this is true in pretty much all the Google storage. Right? When you just push data in, they're automatically backed up. Right? And also they're saying, they're keeping track of changes you do for seven days. So let's say you're updating some tables, Right, and you know, you, you, you like a bad update, you can always roll back, right, and so, seven day change. So, so basically, you know, right, I mean, of course, right, I mean, they're gonna have, um, let's say you're in somewhere else, you know, data in like um, uh, Amazon S3 or something, uh, or even Teradata, right, you can see here, um, they will have adapters. And this is pretty much, you will find all the vendors are doing this because, you know, they will, they will really make it easy for you to bring data in. Right, because I mean, for them, right? I mean, you can imagine like if that part is hard, you say, you know what, oh man, you know, I mean, even bringing data is hard, maybe we should consider another cloud, right? So all the cloud vendors, they will, you know, bend over backward to really make sure data in just is very easy and free, of course, right? Because, you know, they want you to be in the system. <laughs> so anyway, all right. So, and then, you know, like we talked about scale, you know, they can scale to petabyte scale. 
uh, with total pricing models. Either you can do pay as you go, right? Or, or you know, flat flat pricing, right? What else? So again, you know, now you know, as you can see in you know, Google, it's like you know they're kind of gearing all the systems towards AI workloads. So basically, you know, even like when you have machine learning uh, data sets, uh, right? They are kind of you know encouraging you to sort of bring it into, it. and they're building basically machine learning into every product, right? So, right, right. That's that, and we talk about public data sets, like, you know, again. So you know, you can see, right, uh, some of them, right? And also, this is called like some of the, you know, you can even like. Uh, some of the vendors you can actually be subscribed. You can even get commercial data sets, right? So, for example, so let's say you have, um, uh, let's say, right? Uh, for example, let's say you want to get, um, I'm just thinking, what is it? Uh, say, um, uh, oh, there we go, right? So, like stock data. So, it's not free, right? Stock data. So, but if these, these guys, they already have agreement with the Google Cloud. You can actually, like, you know, you subscribe and pay, and then, you, you know, they can actually get access to the data. So, anyway, right? So, so anyway, you can sort of see here, right? Some of these things um, you can get access to. It. So anyway, so they're trying to build this as a like a pretty complete data warehouse. Not only your data, you can also get third-party data here. Yeah. All right, guys. So I'm going to stop here. Any questions? So as you can see, right? So again, this is a pretty attractive offering. So let's put it to practice. So we are going to what we are going to do. They're going to jump into the lab. Uh, any questions so far, guys? You know, ask me any time. So let me. So, so Fiji, sure. quick question. Uh, if you've covered it, I'm sorry to repeat this question. But um, in AWS, they have some low cost uh, data set storage options like Glacier or things like that. Do they mm -hmm. have Google Better ones? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah, Google has the same thing too. So, what they do is when you store data, they have different tiers of storage. Right, so uh, standard is the the one you data you access more frequently, and then from that point on it kind of decreases. Like they are like near line, cold line, archive, right? So these are kind of less frequently accessed data. So if you have some data that you you know you you don't access like once a year or something, then you probably put it in archive, right? They also and, cost less, or uh... and it's cost less. Yeah. So here's the cost, right? So you can sort of see here. So this is terabyte a month, right? How much terabyte a month? So standard storage, you know, like let's say 26 bucks. And as you go down, go down the line, you can see the price kind of decreases rapidly, right? So you put something in the archive, well, you're only paying like four bucks compared to 26 bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, same idea. Like, you know, you know, I know in Amazon, they call it Glacier or something, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, same thing here, right? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And, and this is what I know, I, I, I mentioned this yesterday as well. Like, once you work in one cloud, right? Uh, if you go to another cloud, you will find a lot of the concepts, very very similar concepts. I mean, they may have different names, of course, right? But the concepts and features are pretty pretty similar, right? Exactly. Uh, so that's why. Uh, that's why I always say, like, once you know one cloud, you sort of know them all, right? So, good guys, very good. Um, okay, so let's do this. So let's go into BigQuery Lab. So again, you guys have the readme file open, I hope. So here's a big query lab. So one, two, three, let's kind of do like, you know, public data sets. Uh, let's do one and three maybe, right? Let's start with one. So let me kind of walk you through this. <clears throat> so again, so log into your Google Cloud and go to your big query console. So again, how do you do this? Basically, you know, if you're here, come, you know, right? Look into your, um, uh, again, yeah, so, you know, I mean, there you go, big data, big query, right? So it's under big data. So you gotta kind of kind of keep searching, right? So all right. All right, there we go, right? So you get like a like a little console. Is everyone able to come to the big query page again? Uh, you can either click on this you know uh, big query or you know if you're on the console, just you know sort of navigate on your left nav menu, right? Go down and under it's under big data. Right? Come to BigQuery. And one thing I would recommend is if you're using it all the time, just put a you know click on this pin, right? So when you when you do this, it's it's actually pinned on the top of your menu. See right here, BigQuery, right? So it's kind of handy, right? So you don't have to sort of scroll through the menu. I I I I I never understood like how, how come they don't have like, like a little search right here. 
because you know as you can see there are lots and lots of services right it's very hard to kind of scroll through and find something but yeah i always wondered why they haven't had a search I mean, right it's not like these guys don't know search <laughs> it's well, a, they're, they're like grocery store they're putting meat and <laughs> you know the milk in the very back so that you get to see rest of the products all exactly over. yeah yeah it's like the it's like every time I go to like Walgreens pharmacy, it's like the pharmacy is all the way at the end, right? So you're kind of, you know, working through, you know, everything, right? You're working through the snacks, you're working through the whatever, right? Toys. And whenever I take my kids to the pharmacy, I'm like, oh, you know, they're like, oh, dad, can you get this? You know what I mean? Because they all have some, you know, some new toy. So yeah, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so, right? Well, uh, product placement, yeah. All right, guys. Um, all right. Are we in BigQuery? Okay, good. So let me walk you through this one real quick. Okay. So it's basically what you see, right? Here's your kind of like a little, you know, little toolbar and here's basically your query, okay? All right, first query we are gonna do, we are gonna um, query a standard data set. So this, remember this is the one I was showing you guys earlier, IRS 990. So it's like a tax filings. Uh, I think this is like a non-profit tax filing, I believe, right? Um, so it's already, already in there. So let's look at this one, right? So, Add data, explore public data set. So go to, go to BigQuery, right? Uh, see here in the resources section, add data, right? And public data sets. Okay, are you guys with me? All right. And here, you know, you can just, you know, add, you know, and you should also see like, you know, see if you have data in your project, you know, they are showing up here too, right? So, okay. And here's a public data set. I know I, I sort of have it pinned. I don't know, you know, if you guys have it or not, but you know, I have it pinned. So, you know, so I, you know, I, I see them right away, right? Anyway, so, but for now, let's do add data, explore public data sets. All right. Remember, so this is the one we are, we're looking at. So here, uh, the one we are gonna look at is called IRS. IRS 990, if you just have IRS right here. Okay. So this is what we are gonna have. Where, where did you get the explore, um, add the public data sets again? Oh, so um, uh, you need to be on the BigQuery, um, BigQuery page, right? Sure. Are, you, are you in here? Right. right? Yes. And then right uh -huh. here, add data. Okay. Explore. explore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. How did you uh, come to IRS? Like how did you search for it? Or? Oh, yeah. I just type, you know, I just type IRS. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I, I, I know. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, Got it. on the top search bar, right? Uh-huh. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's look at the data set real quick. So again, you know, right? Again, I you know I just you know right again because I knew kind of what I was looking for. So IRS and you know it has nine ninety. So here's the data. Okay. Let's say view. Okay. What is nine ninety? Non-profit. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So non-profit type files, right? So these are public. So it's not like you know you you as in mind they're not, they're not public, uh, but <laughs> this is non-profit, right? So yeah. Anyway, all right, so let's go view. There you go, all right? So when you get to the view, so see what happened is, see, um, you probably have this window like this. So they have, a, they have a namespace called BigQuery Public Data, right? And under this, you know, you'll see like a lot of, um, you know, a lot of data set like, you know, this, this is Austin. Austin's like Austin bike, bike data, Austin crime and all this, right? Um, and you can sort of see here like Bitcoin. But there are tons of data set that are public. But the one that's currently selected is IRS 990. So imagine like this, kind of, you know, when you, exp you, know, when you, when you expand this, these are like tables. You sort of see that, right? So. So is everybody at this point here, right? You know, when you say, you know, what IRS and when you say explore view data set, you should open this in your BigQuery page with this selected. Yeah. All right, so you know, here's some basic info, right? You can sort of see here. Do they show the size somewhere here? They used to. So this is in a sort of by year, right? Per year, uh, you know, 12, 13, 14, right? Per year filings. And then also like, you know, um, there's some lookups table, you know, remember businesses have EIN, uh, the employer identification number, right? So this is a static table, I think. You can sort of click on this, you can sort of see, right? You can see some basic data. 
Okay, so just like, you know, I mean, these are tables, just go ahead, so go ahead and sort of explore, just click on these a little bit, you know, look at some data, so you can do like a preview if you'd like, right? Previously, you know, I think they show like the first 10 lines or something, right? So, anyway, just like a regular, you know, just like a regular database, basically. Excuse me. Um. All right, so this is, you know, EIN is like, you know, this is a, this is a unique ID for um, basically organization employees, right? So, you know, again, you can still see here, right? There we go. So there's like a, some memorial trust. Look at the data. Yeah, you can see the idea, okay? Yeah, so this is all the IRS data. Yeah, okay, so everyone's at this point. So, you know, just, you know, spend some time just clicking and exploring, you know, schema, uh, details is where, um, oh, there we go. Here's the size we're looking for, right? So the EIN table is about, you know, 400 meg, right? And let's say how much is the filing? Let's see, I wanna look at the filings, details. So it's about also 400 meg, right? So each table is about like, you know, looks like about 400 meg, looks like. And also number of rows and all that. Right? Just like so, you, it's like exploring a SQL explorer. That's it. <clears throat> all right, I want to make sure everybody's on here. Okay. Expand that. Okay, yeah. So yeah, we are here already. So I look at the tables. Okay. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the EIN table. All right. So go ahead and click on the table, and you know you guys already have doing this already, right? EIN table. Oops, not here. All right. So look at the schema, you know, names, types, you know, just like SQL, right? There's not, not, nothing nothing unusual here. And so we can do like a little details, get some idea of the data and preview the data, right? Okay, so all that is done. Um, yep, details, preview, good. Okay. So now let's do some basic query. So I'm gonna do something like, I, I just wanna show the names from, you know, from this table. And when you guys do this, right, also I always recommend good practice to put the name of the table in backticks, right? And this, this is true in SQL too, right? Just so you know, we don't have any conflicts or any, you know, namespace collisions, right? Put, put the table name in the backtick, okay? So the first query we are gonna do, like I'm just gonna look at, just I'm gonna look at the names, okay? So you can do select name, right? So just copy that query, right? That's it. And also, when you guys do this, all right? Um, back tick, right? Um, you can say da, 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 da. Oh, sorry. Let's do this. Yeah. All right. So see how the query is structured, right? So this is thing like thing like this is like a sort of a project, right? So in Google, everything's in the room. Everything's a project, right? So BigQuery public data as a project. Under that, IR is 990. It's like a database, and then under that, these are tables, right? Kind of sort of the hierarchy kind of goes like this. Um, so I have a project. Under project, I have a database, and under that, I have my main tables. My right? table one, table two, so on and so forth, right? So if you look at your editor, that's what you see, right? So you sort of see here on your left-hand pane, like a lower left-hand, there you go, right? So here's my, these are my projects. So I see, you see my own project, you know, data sign GCP2, right? And then, but this is the, this is the Google uh, built-in project, right? BigQuery public data, expand that. Under that, you have, you have multiple databases, right? So for example, let's look at, um, I don't know, like Austin, right? Uh, so if you expand the Austin database, you know, these are the tables, right? So yeah, just like a regular database, right? So that's how, that's how you, you have to sort of map this. And in IRS 990 database, I have a bunch of tables. Does that make sense guys, sort of the hierarchy, right? So project, database, and table. Mm -hmm. And I'm just doing a very, you know, just select name, right? That's it, nothing more, nothing less. All right, let's go and run this query, please. So I'll click on the run button. And you can sort of see here, right? 
progress going. So go is running. First time you run this, it'll take a while because remember, yeah, they, you know, remember how this gets deployed. They had to kind of find some slots and kind of run this. So first time you run this, it'll take a while to kind of deploy. Then, and also, right, say this, they say, okay, you know, it'll process, you know, 50 make data and run. So this is, you know, this is their, they're tallying up, remember, to, you know, how much we pay. Okay. Anyway, so here, here's a name, right? So anyway, right, so, and you can, you can sort of page in it and you know, do the whole thing, right? So just like a SQL. And you can see the stats. Good, right? Simple query there is, okay. Is everyone able to run this, guys? Okay, so if you're able to run, just, you know, let's just keep going, please, yeah? Kind of right, so, and as you guys know, right? I mean, I mean, this is just, I mean, this is like, you could be just querying a database, right? With the SQL, I always look at the SQL um, uh, text box and say, yeah, you know, just punch in a bunch of SQL. You know, just, you know, the, it feels like I'm querying a regular database, even though I'm querying, you know, in Google, right? Very good. Let's see. Okay, we we'll run. Yep, yep, yeah, very good. Okay. Yep, so you know, again, you know, so look at the screenshot, they're kind of highlighting some of the things, you know, we want to sort of want you to keep, you know, keep track of, right? Um, okay, yeah, look at execution details. Okay. Um, right here. So you guys just do a little, little bit here, All right? Click on the execution detail over here, this is in the mouse, right? So these are the kind of, you know, a little bit kind of give you like, okay, you know, how long they are waiting to be scheduled and how much read and compute, right? All this stuff, right? So, and how much data they processed. But, you know, so, right, so basically, you know, remember slot time, basically, you know, how much time you took in the, in the, in the computer, you know, can be in, the, in their compute slots, right? Anyway, so you, you get pretty much all the details out here, right? So. Good, good, right? So just, you know, just get comfortable kind of look, looking through some of the stats, uh, right? So there we go. Oh, so yeah, this is just the results in a JSON format. Okay. All right, guys, so that's that. Let me keep going forward. Uh, quick question, how would you use the JSON formatted information? So. Oh, so um, sometimes, you know, you want to feed your BigQuery results into like a script. Right, so um, right, so the, the the basic this result is good for us, like you know, for humans, you know, we can sort of you know, uh, for display on the screen, but it's not easily possible. So if we, but and so JSON is basically easily programmatically possible data, right? So let's say I want to do like let me let me just one more thing. Let me show this here. Uh, give me a sec. Name and uh, fields. Okay, let me say select name, EIN. All right, from BigQuery, run this. I'll show you how the results look like. So is there an API to access uh, data through BigQuery? Absolutely, like the command line version you mean, right? Yes. yes. No, I mean, I'm, um, I'm using Python from on-prem to access big data. Oh, you mean like a web service kind of a thing? Yeah. Interesting, you know, yeah, I need to check on that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, um, see if you can submit the query queries, yeah, okay. Uh, let me check on that. I know what you're asking. So, uh, um, Fuji, what is the number of the slide that uh, I don't seem to have this thing, big query? Oh no, actually, yeah, the slides are a little messed up. So, you know, this is slide number, what is it for you guys? Slide number 10. But if you look at the slide, it's, you know, there's nothing there because, you know, it looks like, you know, the slide is overwritten in some, some uh, Git merge. Uh, so yeah, don't worry about the slides. Uh, I, I'm gonna send you guys uh, the right slide later, right? Yeah, so there's nothing on the slides right now. Okay. So that's why, that's why I'm working just through the, um, <laughs> I'm sort of improvising and working just through the, uh, through the doc. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, all right, oh yeah, there we go. I'm gonna show you the JSON. Result. Okay, so here's, uh, so I'm selecting two fields, right? Name and EIN. So, so this is, you know, these data is easy to, for me to uh, look and uh, understand, but it's not very programmatically possible. So JSON, if you look at this, you'll see, see, right? So name and EIN. So it's much easier to pass and passing JSON is fairly standard. There are a lot of libraries that will do this for you. So let's say you're feeding the BigQuery result to another program. This is what you want. Yeah. Uh-huh. And 
let's see what's the things from India. Yeah. All right, guys. What else I want to highlight here? Good, good, good. Okay, rose picture conversion. Yep, all that. We talked JSON. We talked about that. Exception deal. We talked about that. Um. All right. So yeah. So you know, like so again, again. So now you know, have a little fun. So you know, basically step eight and onwards. I'm gonna let you guys, so now that you have basic SQL running, right? And this is it, right? So, you know, here's your SQL. You now you do like a where clause, right? Where, you know, let's say, what I'm just asking you to like, you know, where city equals something, right? So you can just, you know, just type in any city you just want. So let me type and say where city equal San Jose, right? So on this, anyway, so, you know, you, you, know, you can consider, you know, execute this or obviously I don't have any, um, so, yeah, so maybe it has, to be, it has to be like one word. So let's say CD equal Hartford, right? Right, run. Anyway, you could there, right? So just just regular SQL, right? Nothing, you know, um, nothing more. Okay, so step eight and onward, guys. Can you guys sort of you know, experiment a little bit? Look at the results, you know, look at, you know, and then also here I'm asking you to do like a little group by city, right? So I'm saying, okay, let, let's see how many cities are filed, right? So again, you know, just regular, I'm sorry, showing you the SQL here as well. You can punch in your own SQL, right? I'll, you know, play around a little bit. So here I'm creating a count per city, like how many non-profits per city, right? I'm doing like a city-wide count. Yeah, so kind of, you know, experiment a little bit. Basically look at the results, you know, look at the execution time, uh, look at the, you know, kind of, you know, Look at, look at the job information a little bit, right? To give you an idea, you know, how, how much it took, how, you know, how many bytes were processed and all that. There we go, right? So here's, you know, no surprise here. They're telling you how many bytes and how many, how much were built, <laughs> right? So, yeah, so, okay. All right, yeah. so kind of, you know, sort of keep going, get comfortable. Uh, let's say, let's say 9 for 2, 10. All right, guys, how's this? Um, so let's kind of give it maybe over 15 minutes and then, We'll take a break. Uh, so nine ten. Can we come back around say ten thirty Pacific? So it'll give you guys time to kind of you know, run through this and also take a quick break, and then we'll resume at that point. Yeah. All right. All right. So, so, so like, Fuji, it is uh, nine fifty, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna give you guys like you know around like fifteen minutes. We're gonna play around a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and then take a break. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, again, you know. Um, SQL query, feel free to kind of, you know, and here, you know, you can sort of do like, you know, um, right, um, you know, have fun with some SQL, right? So, all right, guys, so let's plan to meet here at uh, 10.30. And also, this is um, query one, big query one. Um, big query two is like, it talks to you like, you know, another public data set is Austin by shared data set, right? So uh, we'll skip this one in the interest of time. Next lab will be BigQuery 3. So I want you to query your own data, right? So here we are showing you guys how to, right? So I know how to kind of, you know, um, import data into BigQuery, right? So let's get started on this one and I will review, the, review this with you guys. Okay, so we are doing BigQuery 3 after this one. All right, so let's regroup back around 10.30 and then we'll go over the lab. Break. So back by 10.30 Pacific. So you want us to do one and three? One and three, please, yep, yep. Because two is pretty much the same as one. So yeah, we'll skip this. Uh, so one and three for now, mm -hmm. yep. yep. All right, guys, so have fun. We'll um, come back here in about half an hour or so, yeah? And then, uh, so, and if you have some time, you know, start on three as well, please. Yep, and then we'll review um, as we go along.
All right, guys, I sent you guys the, um... all right. So section two, we are done, right? So basically we did uh, two things, data studio for visualizing and BigQuery. Now, one thing I wanna show you guys, so now that you guys know BigQuery, right? Um, so let me close all this. Um, sure. Um, so let me go to data studio. You can actually pull data through BigQuery. So let me create a blank report. <clears throat> see the data source? See BigQuery right here. You can see, see that, right? So what you can do is you can sort of, you know, right? So now it's gonna, it's gonna the wizard will walk you through the BigQuery, right? They'll sort of say, you know, they'll say, okay, what big project do you wanna be? So, okay, so you can say big BigQuery, right? Again, you know, I don't have a data sets, but if you save your BigQuery results, you can pull from here. See what I'm saying? Or you can do, you can even feed data from the public data set. You see that, right? There you go, right? So you can easily inject data um, from BigQuery into uh, Data Studio and then visualize the data. That's the beauty of the whole thing. So you can sort of, you know, and, and the power kind of comes from this because as you can see, BigQuery can go through huge amounts of data. And sometimes, you know, you want to visualize some, let's like say, you know, you may have gone through like 100 gig of data, right? Like this, right? So maybe your BigQuery, so your overall data is like 100 gig right? And you went through BigQuery and the final results producing is maybe like, you know, just, you know, I don't know, something like CIMO, like say 100K, just, you know, something like summary data, right? And you can very easily fit into Data Studio. So that's how a lot of the visualization people do, like, you know, they go through massive amount of data in BigQuery and whatever the results, right? You, you can visualize very easily, right? In the um, Data Studio. Like, for example, you know, let's say you're doing like a, um, you know, like the heat map on uh, on the on the U.S. states. You know what I mean? Things like that. Do a big query, create your results like you know, like California. You know, whatever, right? Ten. You know, let's say you're doing a COVID. You know, whatever, right? And then you know, Nevada, whatever, twenty, right? Do your. I mean, you may have go through a huge amount of data to create the summary table, and then feed the summary table to Data Studio, and then it'll sort of plot this into like a like a country map, right? So it's very easy. A question: How do I make this uh, dynamic? For example, oh, every. Yeah. yeah, so what you want to do is actually you, when, you, when you want to create big data, see, you want to actually, <clears throat> um, you want to actually create a, a query from big table, right? So what you can do in query, let me go back here to have a query. Oh, I think I'll close it, sorry. Uh, big query, okay. So on your console, let me show you. All right, you can actually schedule query, see? Oh. Right, so basically what you do is you write your query, right? Yeah. And then basically you, know, you can say, you know, right, this is you know, this is pretty straightforward. And you say, okay, you know, here's a query, we're gonna run this query like every hour and then save the result to this table. That's it, oh. right? And, yeah. on, and on the other side, you can actually pull um, data from this table right away, right? Or even you can actually, from even from your within um, this um, data studio, you can actually ask you to run query like right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can say refresh data and then it'll basically run the query and then, you know, pull the data from away for you. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. So, the, yeah, the integration is pretty nice. Uh, so, I kind of explore this a little bit. And again, you know, uh, I'm just showing you guys some, some of the, you know, beginning points. But, you know, uh, you, you should be able to go and kind of, you know, uh, do make the connection. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Very good. So, again, so the power kind of comes by combining these things, right? So, that's kind of, you know, you got to keep in mind. So. All right, guys, so next thing we are going to do, uh, go to Python. Um, so Python, this is a different take because this is something we are going to look at you know, writing Python code. Um, so first thing I want to, uh, Google has a um, couple of environments where you can run Python code. One is called Colab. Uh, this is free and very easy to use. And the other one is called Data Lab. So this is sort of a um, kind of a you know, premium account, right? Uh, so let me show you guys Colab because that is very, you know, very capable and you know very easy to use. So we are going to use this Colab library. So we just going to go and click on Colab, right? Um, lab right here. I'm going to walk you guys through how to set up Colab. Is everybody with me so far? Right. So basically, from your README file, section three, 
we are doing collab one. Mm -hmm. So just let me click on this. All right, so let's first take you guys into collab. Let me see if I can delete all these. All right, so can you guys go to the URL? So you simply you know, go to a new tab, right? Open this in a new tab, right here, step two. And you can sort of dismiss this for now. Okay. So you guys should be in a page that looks like this. Uh, it's called Google Colab. Right. I want to again. So how are we doing this, guys? So from your README file, from the lab README, right? Click on the Colab lab right here, right? And then just you know, you step two, click on the open this link in a, in a different tab. Okay. Is everyone with me so far, right? So this is basically a um, basically a free environment, a free hosted environment for running Python code. Uh, a lot of people you know, use it for like a lot of machine learning, uh, deep learning, which is very popular, but we are gonna start with like a basic Python code, right? So let's start running a simple code. So I want you guys to do like file, upload notebook, please, right? Go ahead and select upload. All right, guys, so again, file, upload, right? Now I want you guys to say, you know, so you, you can upload you know, data from like GitHub and Google Drive and everything, but I want you guys to you know, click on upload section here and then say, choose file, okay? And I want you guys to go where you actually downloaded the, um, the labs, All right? So, Whatever you guys download the data science GCP labs, please go there. Okay. And then should under testing, zero testing, go into the directory. And I want you guys to pick this file called testing123. Okay, again, basically go, go where you, you guys downloaded the, uh, the labs and then go to zero testing. And I want you guys to pick testing123 lab. All right, guys, and then say open. All right, and it should open, All right? Where was the folder again that you said? Oh, it's on, it should be under, so once you go into your lab folder, right. it, should be under, it should be under zero testing. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the and reason it's going to print testing one two three, test, testing one two three. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Testing one three, not the HTML file, but I want you guys to up upload the IPy and B file. Right? It's kind of a weird extension. I will explain what this extension means. Yeah. All right. So right now we are doing data with Python. Right. All right. So everyone has the file uploaded. Right, so it's part of your lab bundle. All right, so what it's doing is, right, so this testing one, two, three is exactly what it sounds like. It's a way to quickly test um, your Python environment. Uh, so um, I'm kind of curious, um, are you guys familiar with, uh, um, let me just, do the Jupyter Notebook real, right? So this is basically what we call a Jupyter Notebook. And if you're familiar, familiar with this, that's great. If not, it's basically a very nice way to run Python code. Let me bring this up here. It's very, okay. Um, so it's a very nice way to write Python code. So the notebooks you will see is made up of cells. Basically, see, when I click on this, see the whole, this is like a one cell, right? And if you click on this play button, you can run the code in the cell. So this is you know this is standard Python code. So what this code is going to do. It's going to just try to sort of load some modules and then say if they are if they are present. That's it, right? So I just ran the first cell. Go ahead and run this too. I just click on the play button here, right? And when you click on the second cell, you sort of see the play button be active and also run this too. And this one is going to try to load 
budget Python libraries. So you can see here, right? So it's kind of printing out, right? So you, they're using Python version 369, right? And then also, you know, looking at modules, you know, say it's found version NumPy, version this, Panda version this, yada, 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 right? So anyway, so what we're looking for right here, guys, is basically a clean run with no errors. And if you ask me, okay, what's the error will look like? You know, trust me, you will know. It'll be like a big blinking red text, right? <laughs> you, you, you will already see an error. So right now we are good, all right? Also, let's say, you know, so, and one thing you will notice is you'll say, wait a second, I also see some text, right? Yes, you do some see some text too. And that's the beauty of Python notebook, because for example, you can actually, you know, add some text here, right? Right? So the, the that's the beauty of Jupyter Notebook. You can mix text and code. So imagine like this, like imagine, and in this text, you know, you can actually even like embed like images. Um, I, don't, I don't think if I, I have any images here, but um, right? It's like, uh, you know, you can do things like image, source, I don't know, like, something, let me find an image here. Um, all right, fine, let me just pull this one. All right, just, just, just to kind of you know, illustrate the point, right? Oh, okay, because they are kind of oh, they are kind of blocking this. Okay, sorry. All right, never mind. Um, so, uh, so much for that experiment. So you can actually embed images here too, right? So what I mean is like this is like a very rich environment. And if you're familiar with code, you know, typically code is pretty dry, just plain text, right? But here in Jupyter, you can have very like rich text environment. You can have you know like you see headings, like you know you can do like you know you can okay this I can do like you know bullet points, right? Right, things like this. Um, right, so your your uh, code is much easier to read because now the document is like you know just not plain text. So you're mixing basically text data and code data, and these are different cells, right? So if you click on this one, this is the text cell you can see, and if you click on this one, see that's why the the play button appears. This is the you know right, this is the um, code cell. How do you create a new cell? Very simple. See here, right here. So you have a choice of creating a code cell or text cell. So simply click on this. Here's your code. All right. So you just simply say print you know, hi or something and execute, right? There we go. So that's how Jupyter identifies which cells are executable. Tech cells are not, code cells are. So we're kind of running code cells. And, and, and the code cells are very easy to identify because you will see the code is kind of, you know, syntax colored like this, right? That's it. So anyway, so that's the kind of like a Jupyter notebook. So basically your code and content mixed together. So it makes it easier to kind of read, read and understand. Um, so here's the, um, right? Um, so here's another one. Just, this is going to just you know try try some basic code again. You know, don't worry about what it's doing. All I'm looking for is a clean run with no error. So here we just like a little graph, right? Make sure the graph library is you know loaded, and then finally here we're just loading some data, right? So you know here just printing out. You know, so actually here's loading from our Amazon uh, bucket. It's a public bucket. Just printing out some data. That's it. So here, what I did is I just ran every cell manually by clicking on them, right? So if you don't want to do this, um, if you want to run all the cells in one shot, you can do this too. So you can go to runtime, click the runtime menu, and then say run all. So go ahead and try that, please, right? So what it's going to do is like, you know, so if you say runtime run all, it's going to run all the cells in order, right? So you don't have to sort of click individual cells or run. That's it. So this is what we call a Jupyter notebook, and this is what you know. These days we use for you know Python and machine learning code. Um, as you can see, it's very easy, right? Very easy to develop and very easy to sort of you know um, uh, write code in, and very easy on the eyes, right? So that's why we use it, and it's all web based. All right. So I want to make sure everybody is able to um, run this code. So what we have done right now is, guys, we basically ran some Python code in our collab environment. The beauty is we are running Python code, but we haven't done any setup. And that's why I like collab because collab is everything is set up for you guys. 
And this is also free. Like if you have a Google account, this is actually free. I believe they also have a premium version, um, like Cola Premium, so you can pay money because for the free version, see what where, where I'm pointing, right? If you guys sort of, you know, um, <clears throat> kind, of, kind of hover your mouse, they can tell you what kind of a computer engine they're using, right? So they're using right now, this machine has 12 gig RAM and what is it like, two C one CPU, I believe, right? And you can see, right, it's, like, it's, it's already powered by computer engine. So, so they limit how much disk and memory you can use, right, because it's a free one. But if you have pay a premium one, then, you know, you can basically connect, you know, set up any machine you guys want with any number of CPUs and memory. Make sense? Now back to the same computer engine, um, uh, computer engine, um, right? So, sorry if I missed this. Yeah. Uh, how do you run them individually? Some individual box? Oh, you mean the, the individual cells? Yeah, just simply, yeah. Yeah, cl yeah, click on the cell and click on the play button. Yeah. Okay. And also, uh, <clears throat> There's a keyboard shortcut too. So if you guys do like a, you can do like a, you know, shift key and enter key as well, right? And that'll execute the code as well. So that, so a lot of people use the shortcut, just hold down the shift key and enter key. You can, you can, you can execute that too. Uh, Suji, yeah. uh, sorry, what is the difference between the, the free one and the premium one? Oh, the free one is capped on, you know, your resources, see, right? You can only, you know, they, they only give you like, you know, a certain like certain memory and certain disk, right? So you sort of you kind of you hover your mouse over, you will sort of kind of see what instance you have, right? Mm -hmm. And that is still pretty decent, right? I mean, they're giving you like 12 gig memory and 100 gig disk, right? I mean, it's, I mean, for free, it's not bad at all, <laughs> right? So, so uh, but premium one, basically you can choose, right? You click on this one, you can choose, right? Um, um, which, you know, which, which instance you guys want to do, right? But do you think uh, with the free one, we can do anything uh, Spark? or anything uh, that, that makes sense to us or? Yeah, I mean, Spark is gonna be a little tight because you know, because Spark is very memory hungry, right? Um, so, but you know, yeah, 12 gig memory, which is, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe a small Spark program you can run. But to run Spark, I'm gonna show you guys a different approach, right? Mm -hmm. We are gonna use something called data prog. But yeah, I mean, theoretically, yes. I mean, you have 12 gig memory, so maybe like some small Spark programs you, you, you can definitely run, right? Yeah. And, and remember, this is a Python environment, right? So this kind of, you know, right? This is a Python environment. So. Yep. What about machine learning and deep learning, uh, things like that? That's right, actually, yeah. Actually, we actually use, uh, when we teach machine learning, deep learning classes, we pretty, pretty much use Colab. Mm -hmm. And you use the free one or? Yeah, we use the free one. And free one is good enough uh, because um, uh, A, you don't need to do any setup on your local machine, right? Uh, and then, you know, so you simply come to Colab and run everything. And another thing you can do in Colab is like, if you go to runtime and change runtime, they even give you access to GPUs, right? So if you're familiar with machine learning, these are called accelerators, meaning your machine learning code will run much faster on GPU and TPU. Right? And so that GPUs, is GPUs like your NVIDIA, you know, graphics cards, right? Uh, yeah. GPU is the Google special chip. Uh, ten, tensor, tensor processing unit. Uh, again, so we won't from performance it, but... standpoint, is there a difference? Uh, yeah, uh, so with GPU, uh, for certain tasks, uh, like machine learning tasks, you'll be e easily 10 times faster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so uh, uh, is GPU and TPU also available for free when? Yes, when yeah, right now, yeah, exactly, yeah. And that's <laughs> and that's, a, that, that's the beauty of this whole thing, right? Because um, yeah, so you know, I mean, they give you free GPU and TPU access. I, I don't, I don't remember any other cloud that gives free GPU. Yeah, that's because, pretty expensive. Yeah, GPUs are pretty expensive, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Amazon uh, charges a lot. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Trust me, we know because you know we we try to sort of we try, try to evaluate a lot of the uh, cloud systems. Uh, this is the only one we know, at least I know of, that gives free access to GPUs. Uh, I think the, which is pretty nice. I, yeah, I think the only drawback with using the free version of Colab, even though you have a free GPU or TPU access, is the runtime of the notebook. I think uh, it times out after 10 hours or something. That's right. So, that or, is true. Or like, yeah, so if you're yeah. training a very deep uh, neural network and it requires an extensive time to train, uh, yeah. it might time out and you're, you might yeah, lose yeah, your exactly. Yeah. That brings me, guys, to the, to, you know, you know, I'll, I'll put my marketing hat on a little bit. <laughs> so I want to invite you guys to this webinar <clears throat> that we are running this week. Uh, 
you this is exactly some of the things we are covering right now so um here's the here's a url i'll also put this on here here's a put on the zoom window um here i'll also put this um here as well um machine learning so how do we look at the upcoming process uh, that you have is it is it yeah so Ah, uh, yeah. So we are kind of working on this. I mean, the website is still kind of, you know, under, <laughs> under construction, but that's why I'm giving you guys link. So this is a series we started running just last week. Um, uh, so the series is basically called machine learning engineering, right? Uh, <clears throat> the reason is uh, a lot of people learn machine learning, you know, they kind of stop at like creating a model and that's it. But there's a lot of other work, a lot of things that has to be done when, when you want to deploy the model, right? So uh, we just had a session, uh, we're talking about TensorFlow version two, right? We talked about this. So just basically what's different in TensorFlow version two. Uh, and I'll, I'll send you guys a recording uh, on this one too. We, we have a recording ready. The next session, which is coming on next Thursday, is basically exactly what you guys talk about, streamlining training, right? What is this gonna talk about is, right? <clears throat> because as you know, as you know, notebooks time out. If you're running like a long, like let's say you're training, it's gonna take 10 hours. You cannot do it in notebook, it's gonna time out. So we are gonna show you guys how to do this, turn the notebook into a command line and you know, run, run on a command line, right? And also maybe send you like a little, you know, um, a little notification on Slack or on your, you know, on your phone when the training is done, right? So yeah, so if you're interested, definitely, definitely um, sign up for this one. If you go to the page, link I gave you guys, just sign up and then you know, you'll get the next um, invite for the next one. Yeah, anyway, so uh, this is definitely, because there's definitely more to machine learning than just creating a model, right? And uh, Sujit, do you guys have any uh, deep learning uh, sessions coming? Like, or... That's right, yeah. Actually, yeah, we have a, uh, in the process of scheduling a deep learning session. Um, mm -hmm. So if, if you get our mails, um, you know, you'll get a mail on that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. if, if you're Thank on the mailing list, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so by the way, this, uh, um, this uh, training series, by the way, is free, right? So we are running like a weekly series. Uh, so we just had one and the uh, session one is just done. Session two coming up this Thursday. Uh, yeah, so this is like a free series, like a webinar style and a, and a bootcamp style, yeah. Would you be able to send recordings for both of them just in case you're unable yeah, to? Yeah, so um, if you can sign up, um, yeah. as soon as the uh, thing is done, uh, you'll yeah. get automatically email, yep. Okay, yeah. thank you. So okay, okay, okay. Free, free series is basically for testing, but you must be having some paid stuff also. Yeah, so this free series doing? basically we are doing a lot of um, free classes now because um, um, you know, because, you know, um, people are working from home and, you know, economy is kind of, you know, taking, you know, taking a deep dive, right? So we're kind of, you know, trying to do a, a more free, free series as well. And also there are paid classes coming too. Yeah. So, um, uh, so the deep learning class you was asking about, uh, is coming in two weeks, I believe. I'll, I'll send you guys an email when, when we announce them. Yep. So, <clears throat> so yeah, we are trying to find a balance between free and pay too, right? Because you now we have bills also. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Uh, good, so good, good. I have a question. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, you might already be informed or uh, someone has asked, but I would like to have these today's uh, recordings so that oh, yeah, yeah. Be... Um, um, so the, the, the Zoom is recording, and uh, once it's done, so we'll do some basic cleanup and then we'll send it to you guys. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because uh, it will be helpful to practice for the future. That's right. Because you know, sometimes you, know, you, you won't be able to, you know, sometimes you cannot just be on the, for the whole thing. Yeah, so yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we'll send the recordings for, for you oh, guys. Thank you. Yes. No worries. All right, guys, so moving on here. So collab, right? So um, basically right now, you know, I even stop asking people to set up their local machines anymore because, you know, this is just so much easier, right? So we just say, hey, go to collab and then run. And, I, and as I showed you guys, right, they give you free access to GPU, which is pretty nice. All right. So, anywho, um, this is what we are going to be using for our Python classes. Um, so, is everybody okay on this one? Testing one, two, three, working fine. Yep. So, basically, you want to run time, run all. You know, you should get a clean run, no errors. Right. That's it. All right, guys. So, let's do. So, we are kind of you know, moving into the Python territory, right? So, we did the BigQuery. So, now we are looking at Python. And I just need to go to Colab. Uh, let's do a, some basic theory on some basic data analytics. So this is slide deck number 11 for you guys. Okay. So um, let's see how we are doing on time. Okay, good. So this is some basic data analytics in Python. And I'm gonna sort of zip through this one real quick uh, because we have, we have some labs coming up for you guys and we will do the labs, right? <clears throat> 
So when you do data analytics, um, so, uh, people talk about what kind of data you guys have, right? So for example, some people, people say, I have continuous data. So continuous data, things like stock price or like temperature, right? You know, they can take pretty much any value, like, you know, 70.1, right? 20.3, just like a, just like a, you know, floating point number, basically. Then they will say, I have discrete values. So discrete values, basically just, you know, just integers. So things like, you know, number of cars per household, right? It can, it can be 2.5, right? It only can be integer values or how many clicks per day, right? So these are integer values, so they are called discrete. And the next, next type of variables uh, you guys will have is called categorical. So what is categorical? Categorical is basically, if you're co coming from a Java background, thing like enums, meaning they can only take predefined values. So let's say colors, right? They can be only predefined values. Uh, states in US, right? Predefined values. So those are called categorical, yeah? And then binary, right? You guys understand binary is basically zero, one, true or false, right? And then finally, we have something called ordinal, which is basically categorical data. Like, you know, they can only take predefined values, but there's order. So let's say, for example, you know, I'm thinking grades, A, B, C, D. So here, you know, I can say grade A is greater than B, greater than C, greater than D. Yep. So these are the types of variable you guys will encounter when you're analyzing data. Continuous, I right? mean, thing like a, like a number, like a temperature, or like a stock price. Discrete, like integers, categorical is basically like only take predefined values and binary and ordinal, yep. <clears throat> and when you look at the data, when you're analyzing structured data, people use a term called data frame. So uh, what are the data frame? You, sorry. Uh, well, question, yeah, go ahead, please, yeah. Uh, which slide is this? Uh, this is slide deck uh, number 11 for you guys. Oh, number 11. Yeah. Okay. Number 11, yep. Yeah. That's uh, called uh, data exploration, yep. So uh, when sorry, you, I don't have, for some reason, I didn't get the yeah. few slides. No, I also didn't get it. Uh, oh, really? Um, did I, okay, let me double check, guys. Um, so, where's my... So I got 12, 13, but I didn't get 11. Yeah, same. Oh yeah, so I'm sorry. All right, you're right, right. All right, you're right. I, I forgot. Okay, system didn't. I didn't see it in the system. Okay, one second, guys. Um, let me email you guys a slice right away. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, ten nine is missing. Ten nine eleven. Okay, gotcha. I don't know how it missed. Okay, give give me one minute. I'm gonna send you guys a slice right away. Okay. Right, give me one sec. Uploading now. And Suji, uh, do you do you all only do Google Cloud or do you also do AWS and Azure? Uh, we are doing AWS and Azure too. We are doing, uh, but um, uh, these days we are getting, so we started with AWS. Can okay, I give you a history, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of AWS, but now we are getting more requests for Google Cloud because um, uh, like Walmart is one of our clients. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so obviously, you know, they're not going to use AWS. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, so they are kind of saying Google Cloud. And also I'm seeing Azure is coming up pretty, pretty big too. Uh, mm -hmm. So, okay, let me send you guys one second. Send these guys out to you guys. Um, yeah, so Azure is being, you know, because look, if you're a Microsoft shop, uh, Azure is, uh, you know, they're they kind of converting everybody to Azure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because it makes sense, right? Even, even their um, things like Outlook and everything is basically be hosted on, on the cloud now. Uh, so yeah, so for them, it's an easy path to migrate. Um, yeah, so yes, so we still do AWS. So actually, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad you asked this question. Sure. Uh, so I wanted to ask this, so I'm new to the whole IT space and all, uh, and sure. cloud and, uh, uh, like I came totally from opposite side from machine learning first and then coming back, coming to cloud. Yep, yep. So I guess my question is from career perspective, opportunities perspective, uh, when you look at Gardner's, uh, magic partner for cloud, so yes, AWS huge advantage over other two in terms mm -hmm. of market share uh, and then now microsoft is catching up very quickly and may exceed at some point 
Yeah. So from can I take that magic quadrant as a weak indicator of career opportunities to for the, let's say one to five years that the most jobs would be around AWS and uh, Azure. Good question, right? I mean, I, I guess you are referring to this. Because those are the yeah, more penetrated exactly. cloud. Yeah, I know what you're kind of saying. Yeah, let me put this up here. I think this is what you are referring to, I believe. Uh, the magic quadrant, right? Uh, where was that? Yeah. Yeah. There you go, right? This guy, right? So yeah, this is interesting this because... One, yeah. So as you guys know, I mean, yes, I mean, this is good to kind of discuss. So let's, so AWS, you can see has a lead because they got started first, right? So they were the first one to really, you know, make public cloud happen. And so they still have a commanding lead over the others, but you can sort of see Microsoft is, you know, pretty close behind. Uh, and uh, the Microsoft, the CEO, what's his name? Um, uh, Sadi Nadal, like he is very mm. like cloud, right? I mean, uh, mm. before him, Microsoft was pretty well, you know, betting on desktops, but now they see the see the light. Now, now they're like, yes, you know, we want to, you know, we want to cloud. So uh, they are pushing cloud very well. Google, as you see, the thing I think they're a little behind on this one is because you know, I mean, Google has all the technology. They just haven't, how do you say, made public yet. See what I'm saying? Uh, when Amazon built the cloud, they basically do the build a public build, right? So. When Jeff Bezos said, okay, you know, we are going to turn all of the services into cloud services. So from day one, it was basically available to all the public cloud, public, right? Pretty much, right? So Google is kind of trying to play catch up here. And I think the secret source Google is betting on is they want to be the cloud for machine learning, right? So if you look at some of the, um, like, I mean, that's, you know, that kind of shows right now, for example, you know, see they are kind of doing the GPU for free, right? Uh, all these things they are kind of betting on, uh, they want to be the cloud for machine learning workloads. So that's their, that's their plan. So if you're asking, okay, so okay, now we know, let's say you, you have a choice of learning any of these clouds, here's the thing, right? I would recommend um, learn a cloud, like, you know, for example, if you're working on a client, you know, who, whatever the client is using, learn that cloud and definitely get certified on the cloud. So let's say, you know, your client is using Azure, right? So, you know, take, a, take an Azure class, you know, get it certified. Because then you can, and we interview a lot of people for cloud and I, I can tell you right away, like if you know one cloud very well, you can easily adapt to another cloud very easily, right? Like for example, I haven't personally worked on Azure, right? I worked on, a, I worked on a AWS and Google. But if, if you drop me in front of Azure cloud, you know, within like, you know, within like a couple of hours, you know, I will know my way around, right? So yeah, so get certified in one cloud, definitely for sure. Because certification tells you, you know, you actually went through the process and you sort of know your basics, right? Uh, that's what mm. I would recommend. So get certified. And certification is pretty easy. Like for example, like, let, me, let, me, let me show you the, you know, Google Cloud certification. This is gonna be we through recently. Uh, Google Cloud certification, right? Um, basically, you can actually, uh, <clears throat> right? You can actually, um, they're like different, different um, uh, certifications. Um, so, you know, data engineers, you know, it's a pretty, pretty good one. Uh, this is probably, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, probably the all, all encompassing registration. And usually if you want to look at the certification, it's like $200 for those tests, right? So you can even do like a self-study, right? You can, you know, either enroll in there, are a lot of free courses online, you can find them or you can go to a class. And then for certification, you just have to, you know, um, it's basically open for everybody. You can simply go to you know any of the certificate centers and take a test at like two hundred bucks for the test, right? And then you definitely you know and so definitely get certified. Especially especially when you are moving from one area into cloud, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because yeah. Anyway, so I'm gonna stop, stop here. Any any, any questions? This is, this is very helpful. Um, actually, if I want, uh, if if you have a couple of minutes, uh, I wanted to make a comment from the commercial side. So the sure. you cover the technical or maybe for the benefit of the class. Please so yeah. <laughs> I was talking to, um, I, I've been interviewing at AWS and, uh, but you know, oh, oh, more towards the, uh, what is it, uh, business leadership. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> uh, you know, Bezos minus two, minus three, they are so, Oh, do not consider Google worthy competitor anymore. 
based on the mistakes they have made mm-hmm. they, uh, so microsoft yes mm-hmm. but microsoft actually they are afraid of and yeah. the business reason for that is uh, that uh, microsoft knows how to get money out of the business side of the exactly you know so they, you know, they already have a large like microsoft already has a large footprint right like yeah. government a uh, lot of companies exactly and they can easily convert them yeah. to cloud yep yeah and so the enterprise yeah. customers you know yep. so they, yep. they can get them uh, they can they can convince the business side through use cases and what not yep. aws has been always sell, selling to it people only and it is a cost center yep. so there is only enough money to go around there So that's what they are afraid of. But uh, Google, no, that's a, that's a, that's a accurate assessment. Yeah. Yep. So, so and, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you this too. Like uh, um, one of my friend's startup was uh, they were evaluating cloud. So they were mm-hmm. so they kind of had um, all the three vendors coming in, kind mm-hmm. of doing like a little pitch. Mm-hmm. And um, so I kind of asked them, how did the you know how did the, you know how did it go? Which one did you guys choose? And they ended up choosing AWS because they said the person who Google sent. they couldn't even answer like the basic questions you know what i mean like it was like you know there were things like oh how much this will cost me to you know what i mean like to you know have this much data uh-huh. Uh-huh. so it's, so at least i mean i mean this is just you know data point of one right but to me yeah. what kind of told me was like you know they were they were kind of struggling on like convincing people uh yeah, they should you know they should go right so my two points on that is um Uh, again it's my own opinion so please take it with a grain of salt if i am a startup would like to build my solution over a cloud uh-huh. for some reason i'll build it on aws uh-huh. an enterprise would like to move my applications everything to the cloud i would choose azure uh-huh. so you know, the, because microsoft has a leg up on the enterprise software they have yep. beautiful toolkits that if i build it on dot net it's no brainer to move it to the azure yep. and the reason past their uh, acquisition of kidup is uh, amazing that's a fantastic acquisition for them so yeah, these two yep. guys <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, no, this is good. I mean, you know, I, I always encourage discussions and 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 true. And this market space is very competitive because it, they know everybody is heading to cloud, right? So there's only so much you can compete on price point. And and also you guys know like features. You know, they are pretty much kind of you know like I would say eighty percent of the features they are, they all have them, right? So now it's all about you know convincing customers like marketing and kind of you know you know what I mean alliances and all this. Yeah, yeah. and and for that you know you guys know microsoft is pretty good at that right because microsoft always like uh, like i can tell you for, you know from our experience like microsoft is far more open to working with vendors and third parties than say google or amazon you know what i mean because you know i mean they still, you know they still think like google especially google they think like you know oh you know right we cannot build this cloud for google you know what i mean we don't need anybody else <laughs> So, uh-huh. so, yeah, so, so at this point it kind of is kind of comes down to not just merit like you know like merit doesn't like who has the best cloud environment but it's more of you know like everything else right so uh Alliances, um right yeah all all that so uh, yeah sure with, go on yeah with uh, with ai coming in full force right mm-hmm. uh, and google are really advancing with tpu and gpu and support yep. for ai right yep and so you think uh, google will uh, surpass all these cloud uh, microsoft and aws in the future just because ai would be supported better in the in the google cloud environment mm-hmm. that's what they are betting on so their google cloud strategy is like ai first right so if, even if you go to like a big query page they will kind of have something called big query ml you know what i mean so basically you can run on machine learning right in big query so they are kind of you know i mean and that's what they are betting on because they also know they are behind here right in the behind the curve so they are kind of saying like if they can leave frog everybody else and become the cloud everyone goes to for machine learning and ai right so again you know it's a bet right i mean it's you know, like i mean it's a very early days right uh, but and so the reason they are giving like you know to me like the, the you know the reason i sort of wonder you know why did they give free tpu and gpu here right is basically they want to attract people right like imagine this imagine you're a company you sort of start writing on call app and you sort of say okay you know this is good we like this maybe you know we want to buy the premium version okay now we want to store our data in google cloud you know what i mean you simply become you know hooked into google cloud right uh, i think this part of the big uh, big uh, big how do you say uh, big outreach 
Mm-hmm. And this is what Google, right? I mean, you know, just like Gmail and everything, they give a lot of these good things for free, but you know, uh, they make their money somewhere else. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Good guys, good discussion. Any other question? This, these are good, right? I mean, I really encourage this because, mm-hmm. I mean, not just code. We need to also understand sort of the how do you say it, the big picture, right? I always say that context matters, right? So, so uh, quick question on uh, the Jupiter Lab: uh, Is there any tutorial, or you would recommend uh, any? Oh, for Jupiter, you mean? Oh, Python or Jupiter, you mean? The Jupiter. It, it, the one you're showing is a Jupiter framework with uh, Python, right? Is that my understanding correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so here's what we're going to do. Like, you know, we're going to run a few Python notebooks in, uh, right? So, uh, Jupiter is so easy. You know, you'll pick it up as you go along, right? Yeah. Okay. And, and and if you do a search for Jupiter tutorial, you know, there are thousands of them online. But, uh, you know, just, you know, if you just go through one or two notebooks, uh, you'll be pretty good, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, guys. So let me see what else we want to show. Okay, yeah. Um, let me, okay, let me zip through this one real quick. And I know we are coming up on lunchtime, um, right? So, uh, so, okay, I sent out the slides, guys. So thanks for reminding me of this slide number 11. <clears throat> so let's talk about structured data. So what, what is a structured data? Think like your Excel spreadsheet, right? It has a bunch of rows, right? And a bunch of columns. So the rows are called samples or customer data, right? Or records. The whole, whole thing is called data frame, right? The spreadsheet is called data frame. And then the inputs we use are called features, right? So typically it's just a column on your Excel spreadsheet. And if you think like a database table, this is just a column, database column, right? And the outcome is also a column like for example, here I'm, you know, let's say I'm, a, I'm looking at um, a credit card application. So let's say I have income as an as an input, and you know how much assets you have as another input, and the output is basically whether you are approved for a loan or not, right? True or false, maybe. So it's going to make sense because again, I'm sort of basically introducing us to some basic terminology in data science. Yeah. So when somebody says these are my features, features are nothing but input. You know, these are my this is the, you know this is the data we are considering. And the outcome or the output is what we are deciding, right? My input here is income and assets, and the outcome is whether you are approved for a loan or not, right? That's it. So data frame is what, like table? What yeah, either if you're coming from a database table, think like a table, right? Rows and columns. Uh, if you're coming from an Excel, Excel world, think like an Excel spreadsheet. Again, rows and columns, that's it, right? That's basically called data frame. Mm-hmm. Yep. Got it. Yep. All right, guys. So, some very basic stats. Again, you know, we, again, we're not gonna spend too much time on this one. I just want to highlight a few things, right? Uh, so let's talk about how we analyze numbers data, right? So imagine I have a bunch of numbers, right? Say, so let's say these are my, this is some salary data. So first thing we do is, you know, we sort of sort the data, right? So this way we can find our min and max. And we can say, okay, my, you know, my range is between these two, right? So my salary data ranges from, right? This is so straightforward, right? Min and max, we get it. Right. Then we want to do an average of the data. Right. Very simple. Average. We know how to calculate this again. You know, I mean, don't don't get lost in the numbers. Average. We know the average. You know, just add them all up. Right. And then divide it by number of number of entries, and that's my average. We get that. And here are the formula formulas for you guys as well. Average is also called mean. Right. So on a, so same thing. All right. Let me show you an example. And again, I'm sort of you know zipping through this one real real quick. So here's my salary data. Right. Let's say I am adding two of the data points, 5,000 here and 400,000 on the right-hand side. So if you look at this, these numbers are very different than you know, the one numbers in the middle. Right? So these are called outliers, meaning you know, right, they, are, they are much, much different than you know, t- typical data, the outliers. So now let's calculate the average, add them all up, right, divide by 10, my average is 83.2. So what's my average? My average is kind of, you know, like here, right? Why do you guys think my average is all the way up here? Because, you know, 400K, right? This basically pull the average all the way to the right. And as you can see, it, no, this is not right, right? Because, you know, it doesn't really represent the actual data. So to do this, to, to basically, you know, remove the outliers, what we do is we say trim. Well, exactly what it sounds like. So what we do is we trim the data at the bottom we trim the data on the, on the top. So what we are left is in the middle. Then we calculate the average there. 
So let's say I'm doing a 10% trim, right? So 10% data dropped on the bottom, 10% data dropped on the, on the top. So whatever's left, we are doing an average and their average is 53.4, right? Which is kind of, you know, right? Somewhere here, which is much more reasonable. So when you hear terminology like trim means, this is what, what people mean, meaning people are saying, okay, hey, we want to calculate an average, but we don't want to be influenced by outliers. Uh, I'm sure you guys all heard a joke, like, you know, when a Bill Gates walks into a bar, you know, it, you know, and if you take an average salary of the average net worth of everybody in the bar, everybody's a billionaire or something, right? Because, you know, <laughs> because, because, you know, this is like, this is like you'll be a Bill Gates, right? It brings everybody's average all the way to the right. So same thing, right? So when you calculate averages, we don't want to do, you know, we don't want to include everybody. We want to trim. So that gives you a reasonable representation of the data. Yeah, makes sense. All right, guys. So, so this is called trimmed average. Okay. Then there's another thing called median. So median is basically sort of the midpoint of the data. So let's say, you know, here's a bunch of data I gave you and say, what's the median? So first we sort the data, right? So then it's a number, sort the data and then find the middle point. What if my middle point is like, you know, two, right? Let's say even data, my you know, midpoint is, you know, between these two data, then we simply take the average of both. Right? So again, the idea is to find the middle, middle point of the data. So sometimes people confuse median and mean because they're kind of similar together. Let me show you an example, right? So here's an example, right? Here's my data set, right? I calculate the mean, mean is the average, right? Mean is 53.4, like somewhere here, right? And the median is the midpoint, which is basically, you know, between 50 and 55, so kind of in order, right? So that's why a lot of people confuse them together because they kind of, you know, they're similar together. But watch what happens when I add an outlier. So I'm adding an outlier of 400,000, okay? Calculate the average, right? Average goes all the way to the right because, you know, it's, it's being pulled by this big number. But the median only moves one spot, right? So it just went from, you know, remember the previous mean? It was like 52.5 and now it was just 55. Even when I, when I had a huge number, right? So that's why we say median is less influenced by outliers. So what is the advantage of using uh, the 10% uh, uh, cut over the median? Right, so the 10% cut is actually gives you an average because imagine um, that's sort of the mid, you're kind of doing a midpoint calculation, right? Yeah. And, and the reason, and again, you know, I, uh, it's a little involved than this, what I, what I just said to you, but basically if your data is like, like a long tail data, like, you know, kind of like, you know, imagine your data kind of looks like this. Let me see if I can draw this here, right? Uh, oops. Um, kind of like long tail data, right? My system is acting up, but you guys get the idea, right? So like a long tail data distribution that looks like this, then whether you use median or mean kind of, you know, matters, right? So again, I won't sort of go too much into this, but you know, mm -hmm. you, you can sort of do, do some reading. Basically, we are, now we are getting into more on the stats ter territory, but yeah, right? But here, you know, for some, right. like average data, you can sort of see here, you can see median is a midpoint. And it's you know less influenced by the outlier, so that's why a lot of the time people use median to give it. You know, so remember, if you if you're listening to news, you know when people say people say median price of you know whatever, right? Median salary of this is this. Median price in San Jose is this. I always wondered why are they saying median? Why are they not saying average? Right? Because now we know. I right? believe average, as we can see, right, can be influenced by um, outliers, but median less so. So next time you learn the news and you know, people say median, median, you know, wage is this much. Now you know, right? because median is more, you know, it's the midpoint. Good. All right. So again, just a very quick median mean outliers, right? So th there are sample codes you will see in the slides. So we, you'll see sample code in R. R is a popular language for you know stats, right? Uh, and also in Python. Since we are using Python, I will stick to Python. And again, you know, so right now we use there are two main pack packages we use: NumPy and Pandas. So NumPy is basically to do any numerical calculation, right? So, and then you can sort of see here, right? NumPy already has built-in functions like mean and, you know, uh, trim median and everything already built in. And here's a trim mean example. So again, I, I won't go too much into the code. You guys have access, access to the code already. Just want to highlight a few things, okay? All right. And so let me sort of skip this real quick. And because, like I said, I want, I want to zip through this one real quick a little bit. I want to show you guys um, how to compare uh, two
two data points, right? So, so, so far we looked at only one data point, let's say salary. What if I had two columns or two variables I want to you know, compare? So what we do is something called covariance, right? So let's say somebody actually, you know, plot, start plotting, say Netflix stock price and Google stock price, right? And they kind of look like this. So to me, I can make, say, you know what, when the Netflix goes up, it seems like Google is going up too. So maybe they are kind of, they're going up together, right? So maybe there's a relationship. So that's what I'm trying to figure out, right? So again, you know, all these formulas for your pleasure, right? <laughs> Skip all of this. Uh, one thing I want to tell you is called correlation. This is something you will hear quite a bit about. So same thing, right? Correlation basically measures how two variables react to each other, right? And the reason correlation is again, I'm sort of, you know, zipping through this one guys, I understand this just for interest of time. So the reason why we like correlation is it's actually the correlation values between minus one and plus one. So let's say you can get a correlation value for two variables and let's say they are plus one. That means the perfect correlation, meaning when one goes up by 10, other one goes up by 10 also, right? Kind of like your graph kind of looks like this, right? So perfect correlation is like, you know, like this. This is plus one. At a high level, what is the difference between correlation and covariance? So correlation is basically normalized between minus one and plus one, right? Uh, covariance is not normalized. So covariance, you just get a number like, like this, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to interpret. Uh, so that's why we like correlation better because correlation actually, be, you know, uh, normalized between minus one and plus one. So you can, you know, you can sort of make sense of the number, right? That's why, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of people prefer correlation because it's actually a defined range. Now, this is plus one, right? Meaning perfect correlation. What about minus one, right? So if it's minus one, that means they are perfectly correlated, but on the opposite direction. So we just saw plus one like this, right? This is plus one. Minus one, you can imagine, it's going to be like this, right? They are perfectly correlated, but you know, when one goes up, other one goes down. Zero basically means no correlation. So when you calculate a correlation within two variables, right? So sometimes you get like, you know, you're not gonna get minus one or plus one, you're gonna get a value, you know, value in between. So typically we get something you know, along this line between like, you know, 0 0.8 and 0 0.1, I'm sorry, 0 0.8 and 1, we say it's strongly correlated, meaning you know, they, they, are, they go up together. It was like below, you know, below 0 0.5 and zero, they would say, you know, what is weak correlation? Meaning, you know, doesn't seem to be, you know, that much of a relationship, right? So again, we will use this quite a bit when you analyze data, because we want to understand uh, which, of the co which of the factors are correlated. Let me show you an example, right? So here's an example, you know, we talked about like, you know, right? Plus one, minus one, zero, yeah. Zero meaning like you can see there's no pattern. Okay. And formulas, okay. So I'll skip over the code. Let me show you guys this matrix. It's called correlation matrix. So now we know how to calculate correlation between two variables. But what if I have more than two variables? No problem, we put them in a matrix. So here are my variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, right? You can see here. So what I'm doing is each cell is gonna calculate the matrix, uh, correlation between, the, see this one calculates x1 and x2, x1 and x3, right? Look at the matrix. But if you look at the cells in the middle, or in the diagonally, you can sort of see here, what is this one calculating? X1 and X1, same variable, right? So that's why it's perfect one. Because why? It's like you are 100% you, right? So we compare two variables, X1 is 100% X1. So that's why it's perfect correlation one. So that's why if you look at the diagonal, it's always one. You can see that, yeah? And this cell measures X1 and X2, X1, X3, so on and so forth. So, so we, look, we look at a correlation matrix, you wanna understand, okay, diagonal should be one. Okay, so this is the theory, right? Let's put it in the practice. Let me show you an example. So let's say I'm analyzing some stocks, right? Let's say my stocks are A, B, C, D, right here, okay? And look at the correlation matrix, right? Diagonals are one, we got that, okay, very good. Now, in a stock market, right? Let's say I want, I want to diversify my stock. And I want to basically, you know, identify stocks that are highly correlated. Like things like Netflix and Google, right? When, when one goes up, other one goes up too. So can you guys take a look at the matrix, right? And you guys only have to look at the, you know, matrix of the numbers. I'm looking for strongly correlated. What I mean is like, I'm looking for 
numbers pretty close to plus one. So which stock pairs you can see that are close to plus one? Can you look at the numbers and tell me? A, B, C, D, which one, which, which pair is close to plus one? So C and D are very close to uh, correlated. C to and D, A. yeah. So very good. C and D, that's 86%. That's very good. Yep, yep. Uh -huh. A, and very good. A and D, sure. I mean, A, I mean, yeah, that's almost one. That's very good. Like 99%, right? So 0 0.99, yeah. Uh, very good. Any other, any other pairs that are close to plus one? How about this one, A and C? A and C, yeah. Yeah, you can see that, right? Exactly, yeah, very good. So, A, so A and D. A and D, exactly, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, we see it here too, right? So this is very good. So now we understand. So what it means is these stocks perform um, very, you know, how do you say, very, um, you know, uh, highly correlated, meaning, you know, when one goes up, the other one goes up too, right? Now the reverse question, let's say I want to identify stocks that are not at all correlated. I want to diversify my stock and I want to diversify in them. So, you know, when one goes up, you know, they had no impact on whatsoever. So what you're looking for is something close to zero. Can you guys identify some pairs that are close to zero? B and C. B and A C. And e. There you go, B and C, yeah, very good. And so yeah, what's the other one? A and E. A and E, yep, yep. There you go, it's like almost, yeah, 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 barely 10%, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. B and E. B and E. Uh, B and D. Ah, so this is about 49%, right? E so, e e e e e e oh, there we go, there we go, there we go. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah, good, good. Cool, e so, now, e so e now you just get this, right? It's basically like, so if you're looking for zero, meaning like, you know, they kind of move in, you know, different directions. So if you want to diversify your stock, you don't want to put them in strongly correlated, you know, correlated stocks, you want to sort of put them in close to, you know, something close to zero. So you just got the idea, right? Um, there was like, um, I mean, now, you know, everybody knows the, um, so the stock market is kind of, you know, right, uh, going the all the time. So let's say um, you're doing some stock market analy analytics. So let's say this is my Dow Jones, right? Right now going down, right? So this is like Dow. I want to invest, invest in a stock or, you know, some fund that actually has an opposite effect. When Dow goes down, I want my stock to go up. Do you guys know any stock like that? Gold. <laughs> Right, so what we are looking for is something like a, you know, like a negative correlation. Right, meaning when you know when Dow is going down, I want something that goes up. You can see that, yeah. So you are looking for something in the correlation in the minus one territory, right? Meaning like they behave opposite way, right? When the overall stock market goes up, I'm looking for something that goes up. Yeah, <laughs> there's something called VIX. Have you guys heard about this one? This is the, this is called a volatility index. Right, check it out. Right. So which is like a kind of like almost like a mutual fund, but you know, it's like an index, but you know, it, it measures the stock market volatility. In good times, it's pretty low, but now I think it's pretty high. Yeah, so that's killing VIX as well. So they both are correlated now. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, so anyway, right? So kind of a fun thing to kind of do, like you know, if you want to sort of do some you know, analytics, right? I mean, I know, so sometimes the theory can be a little dry. So that's why I always show you as an example. Yeah, this is a lot of people use them, right? On a very simple terms, you can plot the stocks and kind of say, okay, hey, which one's highly correlated? Right, so anyhow, all right, guys, makes sense. Any any other questions on this one? Okay, all right. I want to do. So, um, do you use your advanced knowledge uh, of this whole statistics stuff and cloud and all that for your stock investment? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, right? I mean, yeah. On, on, only if I could figure that out, right? I'll be a very very rich man. <laughs> so. Uh, I haven't figured that out just yet. Yeah, yeah. So I made of... a death forecast model, unfortunately, for COVID, uh, just for my own understanding. Oh, yeah? Based on that, I made stock investment. I thought that $5,000 would be the, ma uh, no, 5,000 deaths would be the magic number when uh, psychologically the market would break. Right, right, and right. That, no, people didn't care about 5,000 deaths, so I lost my money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so, I mean, you know, talking about stock market, I, right now, I do not understand the behavior at all, right? Because, you know, I mean, every news I hear is how, you know, all the businesses are closing, people are out of work, people are filing for yes. unemployment. No correlation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's right, yeah. But the market's up. I'm like, okay, I, I don't really get this, like, you know, is there a news I'm missing that's like something uh, positive? Trump's election is uh, news. <laughs> 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 so yeah. yeah, either market is excited about the two trillion, whatever, right? I mean, uh, again, again, you know, okay. So that's a, that's another conversation. But yeah, honestly, I don't get this at all. Like you know, because every news I hear 
is pretty dire and stock market seems to be rallying. So anyway, um, uh, make, make, make of that what you will. All right, guys, so right, so again, you know, code, I'll, let me skip the code real quick. Um, okay, so one thing we're gonna quickly do, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna uh, run through this uh, graph real quick and we're gonna do some labs after lunch, right? So we, we looked at visualizing data using um, uh, Google Studio. But um, uh, if you want to do some custom graphs, you know, Python has a pretty good uh, library. So I'm gonna introduce you with some basic graphs here just to get you guys started. So you know, we're gonna look at a few graphs, right? So one of them goes to box plot. So what is the box plot? Box plot basically just says, you know, we give, we give it a number range. So let's say this, here's my data, do a box plot. What it does is it kind of does like the min, max, and also like the, you know, Q1, Q2, Q3. What is Q1? This is 20 percentile, right? This is 50 percentile marker, mid midpoint, and also 70 percentile, right? Uh, min max. I mean, most of the time it's min max. I mean, there are some exceptions. You know, let's just stick to min max for now for simplified to simplify it. And this is also median, right? Remember, median is the midpoint, 50% marker. So when you, I mean, you have probably seen this graph like this when people look at like you know, you know, some numbers like house prices, salaries, things like that. So it kind of gives you a snapshot of you know what the you know what the data looks like, box plot, right? So very handy to kind of quickly understand what your data looks like, and where's the median, and you know where's the midpoint, where's the min max, right? So things like that. So we'll do this in the lab. The other one, so again, you know, uh, here's an example in R and Python. I'll show the Python code real quick, right? So, you know, these are like one liners, right? So there's like a box plot function. So, uh, so I'm using a matplot library, right? So as a plot and plot.boxplot, that's it. Just one liner code to plot this data for me. Mm -hmm. So, and, and and you guys will do all, all of them in the lab. So. Um, Histogram is basically, let me show the histogram here, is basically sort of, you know, counting data. So let's say this is my bunch of salaries. I want to count, you know, how many people made between, between 20 and 30,000, 30 and 40,000, right? I'm sort of counting buckets. So these are buckets I'm counting, right? I think these are like buckets of five, right? And then I'm counting how many people between 20 and 25,000, how many people made like 25 to 30,000, so on and so forth, right? And so this is called histogram. Again, one liner, right? Plot dot hist, and then give give the sign, give the give the data. So I have a question here. Sure. So could I assume that uh, uh, that Google Studio uh, uh, can do box plot and stuff oh, yeah. too? Yep, yep, they can do all this. Yeah, and it looks better. It it just does look better, exactly. So the reason we are introducing you is like sometimes you will have your own data, right? Uh, you may not have access to Google Studio, right? So, um, so you know, so so here we are showing you how to create some basic graphs in Python, right? That's it. Yep. Uh, so if you want yeah. to do some presentation, definitely, yeah. I mean, and I will definitely use prefer Google Studio because you know, they, as you can see, right, they create very nice graphs, right? But this is something for you guys to programmatically create graphs very quickly to explore some of the data because sometimes you are working on a notebook, you don't necessarily want to sort of upload the data to Google and you know do the whole thing, right? So you just want to do a quick graph, and that's what this is. Yep. Yeah. And scatter plot is basically, you know, for example, you know, like you have, you have some X and Y data, right? You just plot them and sort of figure out if there's any, any relationship. So here, you know, I have some build data and tip data, right? So I can build on the X axis and tip on the Y axis. I just plot them randomly, but it looks like there's some relation, right? They can seem to be like, you know, kind of correlated, right? When the bill goes up, tip goes up too. Interesting, right? <laughs> but we know that of course, right? But, but now when you look at the plot, it's pretty obvious. So, all right, guys, so that's good. So here's the deal. We are going to um, break for lunch. When we come back, come back in an hour, I say, let's say it's almost 12, so I come back at one o'clock uh, Pacific. Um, and we are going to do a bunch of laps together, just so um, we can sort of, you know, just, yeah, we can save some time. So the laps you're going to do, guys, is very quickly, just a hello, Jupiter. Uh, let me see. We will do, uh, Python, um, Python three and four, right? Actually, I'm sorry. Let's, let's just do you know Python one, two, three, four, right? very quickly, right? And these are these are kind of small labs, so you can do them in you know pretty quickly. So that's what we are going to start with, and then we are going to data analytics. Okay. So right, this is right after lunch. Uh, next hour or so, we'll kind of do the lab. Okay. All right, guys. I'll see you guys after lunch in an hour, say one o'clock. Yeah, one o'clock my time and then we'll jump into the labs. 
1 p.m. back by 1 p.m. Yep. All right, guys, I'll see you guys in a bit. Yeah? Hello, guys. We are back from lunch. How's everyone? Had a good lunch, I hope. <laughs> good. Yeah, feeling sleepy. I know. <laughs> That's the danger of good lunch, right? Put you to right to sleep. Yeah, yeah. Um, good guys. So um, I want to make some um, look at some Python code. Uh, let me share my screen. And there are a bunch of Python labs. You know, we probably won't have time to do all of them, but I, I want to show you guys a few uh, so you can get started. Um, so, so the. <clears throat> So just a Jupyter lab, right? You guys have seen this already, um, right? So what you can see is, it kind of walks you through Jupyter. It's pretty straightforward. For example, you can sort of see here, um, you know, Jupyter is basically a mix of code and content. So you can create code cells and content cells. So what we'll do is we'll kind of, you know, do a few Jupyter labs and, um, um, right, and, and you'll be, um, you get used to it. It's pretty pretty straightforward. So let me see if I can do, um, let's see what we all do. So let's do like a basic matplot intro. Um, so if you look at this, oh, interesting. Okay, I don't mind why it's, okay. Let me see Python intro. So if you guys look at this here. Oh, sorry, it's Python basics, I'm sorry. Okay, so the links are broken guys, I'm sorry, yep. Um, right, these links, um, okay, it's actually, um, under the Python basics directory. So here I sort of, <clears throat> you guys can see my screen. Here I have a few NumPy, Pandas. These are some basics library in Python. And if you're gonna be using data science, definitely get used to these. I cannot, you know, um, um, give them as kind of a reference to you guys. So you can sort of see how to uh, manipulate numbers. So NumPy is very critical. Um, so NumPy library uh, does make some um, numerical you know, computation, like you know, like you know, dealing with numbers, like multiply numbers, matrix, all that stuff, right? Um, all that, all that heavy duty stuff is basically handled by NumPy. The reason NumPy became very popular is uh, before NumPy, uh, Python had some built-in arrays and things, but they were not very efficient. So if you're doing like, some hardcore number crunching, the performance is pretty bad. So what NumPy was written is they give you Python API, but the execution is done in C, right? C, C++ basically. Uh, so it's, it's very, very fast. So you get the best of both worlds. You're writing in like py, py, high level Python API, but the execution is, uh, is very fast because it's native code, right? Anyway, so after NumPy, pretty much every, and they became so popular and a lot of other packages started using NumPy as well. So that's why you know, just losing NumPy, kind of just go through the code a little bit. So it shows you know, how to declare arrays and you know, how to declare matrices, things like that, right? So, so pretty handy. Uh, yes, Python is an interpreted language, right? So question is, yeah, so, so Python uh, is interpreted. Um, however, you can compile Python code and submit it. So, so you can do both, but most of the time when you run Python code is interpreted, right? Uh, when you submit in production, uh, what some people do so at, at the production uh, submission time is you can compile Python code and then submit the compiled code. But um, most of the time, the performance is acceptable. We just you know we just run the Python code as it is. Uh -huh. All right. Guys. So the one I wanted was um, um, Matplot intro. So let's do some graphs. So for this, if you look at the uh, if you look in your labs look under Python basics directory. So you see like one, two, three, right? By the way, if you're wondering why I have two files for each, you know, each lab, remember the IPython notebook, that is in IPy VNB, these are what we call Jupyter notebook. Um, and if you click on this, most likely, you know, it'll just open like in text editor, or, you know, unless you have Jupyter installed, you won't be able to see them. So that's why we give you the HTML version of the file. So if you click on HTML, right, that, that opens in any browser. But also remember, this is read only, right? You cannot make any modifications, right? So HTML code is just for the read only. So you know you, you can quickly look at the um, look at the code in a browser. 
But to look at the IPython notebook, you need Jupyter environment installed on your browser, in your computer, I mean, yep. <clears throat> um, so what do you want, guys? I wanna do lab number four, right? Just do like a basic graph very quickly. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna, from core lab, right? So, uh, okay, file upload. Okay, choose a file. Kind of navigate through your, um, whatever you just downloaded the, um, right, the labs and under Python uh, basics. So let's do matplot number four. So just some basic graph, right? Upload that. I wanna show you guys how to do some basic graphs in Python. That's a good skill to know. Okay, so is anybody, everybody able to upload the data and the call app? So by the way, whenever I see, you know, we're executing Python code, we are gonna be using call app, right? Um, so that's easy, as you can see, right? Just online, it just works. Okay. Um, are there no issues with the Jupyter Notebook um, endings and, and uh, call app? I'm oh, sorry, uh, Jupyter Notebooks and uh, what was the other one, I'm sorry? In Colab, there's no um, issues in uploading those files? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Is there a particular one now you are concerned about? No, I'm just curious. So just the ending of I I P Y N B. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And th that's a file they would expect. Like when you, when, you go to, when you go to upload, right? Those are the files they will actually, um, uh, where's my, yeah, All right? Those are the files they will display. I, P, Y, N, B. So these are standard Jupyter notebooks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Yep. All right. So what we just uploaded, guys, is under Python basics, uh, number four, matplot intro, right? So this you can actually, you know, you know uh, go along with me. It's a very quick lab. Again, I want to sort of show you guys some of the Python code. Um, so here is basically, if you're new to Python, right, we are importing, uh, this is some standard stuff, you know, you'll see in a lot of Python classes, you're importing all yeah, the popular packages. Yeah, it's, oh, sorry, the, the, the lab file you mean? Under Python basics, right? So you, you have lab open, right? Lab directory, look under the Python basics directory. You will have four matplotlib. <clears throat> yep. So I'm showing us here two graphics packages. One is matplot. So this is sort of the workhorse of Python visualizing. It can produce some pretty capable graphs, right? Um, Seabone is a high level library built on top of this, kind of gives you a little, you know, little better graphs. And you will see both, right? Um, so, and like, so the first thing is importing matplot. The reason I'm saying here is inline saying, when you, when you do a graph, yeah. show it actually right in, in, inside uh, the nice. notebook don't, uh, you know, don't like pop up a window or something, right? That's all we are saying, okay? So let's do a box plot. So here's a bunch of numbers, right? So that's salaries, right? So here, right, look at the hint, okay? A Maybe quick question. Right. Sure. So when we say import pandas, SPD, and uh, import NumPy and NP, so where uh -huh. is it importing from? Oh, these are, these are libraries already installed, like in a in collab environment. So, okay. Right, remember the testing one, two, three notebook, if you remember, right? Yeah. Uh, it was basically testing to make sure that we had all the libraries. So, so had I been in Jupyter, where would, and probably I would have had to do the same thing, where would it have still imported from? Right, so uh, so these are Python libraries. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So the way you, you these will import. So, okay, I'm running on Cole app, but what you're running actually is on a Python environment. Let me bring up a, something in. Draw, draw here, right? So let me. Right. So, yeah. Uh, da, da, da. Hold on. All right. So, so basically, okay. So kind of you know, kind of kind of the basics. Let me get all this out. All right. So, all these libraries, pandas, numpy, matplot, they're all part of the Python ecosystem. So the way you're thinking about it, like there's a Python runtime. Um, and so, so Python runtime has all the Python libraries. So these guys we are using, right? Sort of the, you know, the matplot, pandas, these are all modules or packages. So in Python runtime, you'll have tons of, you know, modules installed usually. Usually 
hundreds, right? And the re so it's, everything is modularized because this way, you know, uh, the code is uh, reusable. So NumPy and Pandas are basically, you know, two packages you see right here. Is that gonna make sense? So when you're loading this, like so when you're running, so even Jupyter, right? That's the thing, like even Jupyter is actually a, um, uh, like, so for example, like say, well, well, so this, this say Pandas is one package, right? And say NumPy is one package. And even Jupyter, you know, is a package. So everything in Python is pretty much modularized into packages. So when you're loading this, what you're loading is, you're kind of you know, loading these packages. So let's say you're running on Jupyter, right? You're running a Jupyter uh, environment, right? <clears throat> So as you say, when you're loading Python, you're kind of loading it from your Python environment. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, thanks. So, so what happens is, um, so typically, <clears throat> okay, let me kind of, you know, just, like, just a little bit more, is typically you would actually, in, you know, install your Python environment in your laptop. So, you know, this would be like your laptop, for example, right, you would install this. Uh, so a lot of the data scientists uh, will basically, you know, install the Python environment. The environment we are using right now is called Anaconda. So, um, so Anaconda is a Python environment. So let me show you guys this. Um, right, Anaconda Python. Okay. So, as you can see, Anaconda. Uh, so Python is an open source package. Right? It's an open source language. Everything is open source in Python, pretty much. What Anaconda does is it kind of they have their own distribution. That includes Python and like you know some of the some of the you know like well known packages. So they can have, it's like you're installing like Linux, right? So when you get Linux, uh, even though Linux is open source, we don't go, go and download and install everything. We actually kind of you know um, get like a distribution like Red Hat or Ubuntu or something because why it's all well put together and tested together. Same thing in Anaconda. Anaconda has a Python distribution, but they kind of make sure like you know everything working well. They include all the packages. So when somebody says I'm using Anaconda, excuse me, I'm using Anaconda, what they're meaning is they're using Anaconda Python. That's it, right? Um, so these days, Anaconda is pretty de, de facto now. Um, we, we recommend Anaconda for all of our users because it has all the basic packages included. So you don't have to go and kind of include these things, you know, and, uh, install these things one by one. Is that gonna make sense? So it's like, a, it's like a one big bundle that has all the usual stuff, yeah? So anyway, so that's kind of the, some of the terminologies. Like, so when somebody says I'm using Anaconda or whatever, that what, what it means, like, you know, it's a Python distribution. So typically you will actually have your uh, Python on your laptop, but in Google Cloud, what you're having is, <clears throat> instead of your laptop, you're kind of running on Colab, right? And in Colab, how are they doing this? Basically in Colab, if you look at the Colab um, runtime, so, you know, can we move your mouse over? They're actually using a, you know, a Google compute engine. Remember like, you know, the, the compute platform you just launched yesterday. So you can see, right? You can sort of, you know, see how it says Python 3, Google compute engine backend, right? So basically what you have right now is, you know, the UI is basically backed by a machine behind the scenes. Make sense? Kind of, you know, that's how you have to visualize, right? So just like you guys were launching a computer, you know, a VM yesterday manually, but here Google is kind of, you know, I mean, they probably had thousands of these things launched and they are linking one of these to your notebook. Anyway, so that's kind of the, kind of how it all kind of happens, right? So, um, so rather than having to install on your laptop uh, and sometimes when you do this, like sometimes, you know, you'll install something, sometimes things don't work, your packages are missing. There are a lot of things that can go wrong, right? So that's why I recommend a collab because as we, as we know, you know, it's like a pretty much a click point and click environment, <laughs> right? So everything just works. Anywho, so hopefully that answers the question. <coughs> so, so we are importing, <coughs> excuse me. So we are importing our our pa packages from you know from our uh, from our Python environment. And the first thing I'm going to ask you is like I'm going to do a box plot. So I simply say, all right, guys, you know, do an array. Right, here's a bunch of you know, a bunch of bunch of numbers. So box plot is what you're saying, right? So let's see. We execute this. There we go. Right, here's a box plot. You can sort of see it, right? Like a min, max, range, the whole thing. And you can also do uh, SNS. SNS is like a you know Seaborn library. So we'll say box plot data. You want to give the salaries as a data. Okay. And then you'll see it's a little prettier, right? I mean, you sort of compare these two guys, right? So the mat plot is kind of a basic graph. I mean, it's still decent, but the Seaborn graph tends to be a little more, right? Polished. That's all there is. 
Okay. Getting uh, it says uh, syntax error. Oh yeah, so you need to make sure you know when you see these question marks, you need to sort of you know you need to fix those, right? So when you have this question mark, you need to sort of you know oh. do, right? Yeah. So so I kind of want you guys to do it like a later, right? So give the data as a salary. So give the salary as a data. Yeah. <coughs> All right. So you guys have the two graphs going on, right? So the box plot. So it's the, it's the data we are plotting this, and also C bone also plotting. Right. All right, let's do histograms. So same data, salaries, right? And here, basically, we simply say hist. That's a that's a whole histogram, right? Simply just say and then execute the code. There you go, right? You get the you get the right result. <coughs> same thing here in SNS, right? So I mean, yeah. So I I sort of forgot to put the spaces here, right? Just like here. So they kind of you know, all squished together, but you, know, you guys get the idea, right? <clears throat> yeah. Sushi, I got a question. So how do you know the functions that come with inside of no, no, NumPy? For example, like, like, the, the hist, hist uh, function or method. Oh, I see. So, okay. So, like, how do you know which methods are available kind of a thing, right? Yeah. Yes. So, this sometimes, you know, okay, so that's a good great question. So, one thing you can do is uh, you can type np here, right, numpy dot, and then you hit the tab key, you should see all the methods available, right? So, these are all the methods. And you can see, like, numpy, you know, I mean, it has tons of methods available. So, sometimes uh -huh. you said, you know, kind of, you know, you're kind of, you know, uh, look at read the doc as well. Like, for example, you know, what is like, you know, uh, I don't know what, uh, you know, I mean, I can probably guess, you know, what this is, you know what I mean? You, but you get the idea, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I just had to read the doc, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the tab completion in Google um, uh, Call App is pretty good. Um, but yeah, sometimes you just had to, you know, read, yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, so now we are defining two data points, bills and tips, right? And here I'm going to use a scatter plot. Again, so you know, look at that. Look at the hint here, right? So we can, you know, kind of give you guys, you know, some, you know, help, help you, right? Scatter plot. And if we do this, there you go, right? And same here, scatter plot. And the only difference is, like, you know, now the axes are labeled, right? That's it. As you can see, the C bone, C bone graph, to C bone graph, as you can see, you know, it's a little, right? It's a little nicer with the colored dots and everything. Again, guys, so I mean, the goal here is, uh, you know, not to teach uh, <laughs> Python. It's basically, I'm just showing us how to execute Python code in the Google Cloud environment. Right, that's kind of the goal. So yeah, so again, we are using Colab. As you can see, it's very straightforward, right? And by the way, all your code is being saved. Like for example, if you go to file, say open, right? So you sort of see in Google Drive, they actually save all of your work in Google Drive. See that, right? So you can sort of see, you know, here's something I just like, you know, three days ago. See what I mean, right? So yeah, so all your work is saved in Google Drive. So work is not lost. So if you can actually go find them, go to Google Drive, all right. Um, so where's my Google Drive? Oh, there we go. So on the Google Drive, you'll see a directory called Colab Notebooks. Excuse me, right? And that's where you have all the files. <laughs> so, so everything you guys are doing in Colab is actually backed on Google Drive, right? So. Yep. Yeah. All right. Good guys. So. Again, just a very simple graph, right? Um, just to kind of illustrate some of the in, in, in call app. Any question on this one, guys? Um, Suzy? Uh, yeah. This uh, matplotlib introduction that everything, there is some errors in the code. It's not running immediately. For example, uh, there is a First, uh, initially, I tried to run this one uh, box plot. Uh -huh. uh, there is no like code like uh, there is some errors are there in the code. So similarly, um, 
Uh, what it is, a box block and uh, SNS. What is right, right, okay. So probably, um, so what happened was like, you know, you probably see like, you know, probably see the question marks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably yeah. that. So uh, replace the question mark with the function name. So I kind of wanted to guys, so, you know, just do a little, little, little uh, work here, right? <laughs> that's why I want to sort of, you know, if you okay. see question marks, just replace them with like the function. So the function, function. name, look at, look at the hint. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a, yeah. I know. I know. It's, 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 yeah. I should have probably explained this a little better. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. That that that's what it is. Yeah. Exactly. Because I kind of want want you guys to just you know think about this a little bit. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank. Okay, yeah. Yeah. No worries. Can I see what you did after a scatter blot, please? Oh yeah. So all the way down here. Um, yeah. Right. So just scat plot or scatter, right? Okay. Okay. And then also the last one is just in you know, a plot or scatter. Oh, only thing here is you know I'm just defining labels, right? So we're showing how to okay. define labels for so X, X, and Y. That's it. So you sort of see the okay. label showing up. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Again, you know, like I said, you know, um, so if you say, oh, you know, these graphs are kind of you know simple, <laughs> they are. Uh, so let me show you guys this matplot uh, gallery. There you go, right? So here are some of the graphs people have created with matplot. So as you can see, right, you know, it's a very capable, right? Very capable library. So you know, you can sort of see, like, you know, people have created some some pretty awesome graphs, right? So like, for example, some of the graphs, you know, you can even create from um, Google um, Data Studio, right? Because you know, Data Studio only has few templates, right? So my band plot on, and on the other hand, you know, you can see, right? You can create some pretty, pretty much anything. You can pretty much plot anything, right? You can see, as you can see, I'll put this link here on your Zoom and also in our, in our doc. Right. right. Mad plot. Gallery. Anyway, so again, just some basic stuff, right? Just so, just so we can very quickly um, do some graphs. That's it. All right, guys. Okay. Good. So let's let's do one more. Um, but this one is a little bit more involved. So I'll, you guys can do do it along with me. Um, so the the basic stats and things I'm leaving it to you guys as homework. What I want to do, let's look at some analyze some real world data. So let's look at some house price data. Okay. So we are going to do data analytics two. So if you look at this, it's a basically a Python code. So what I want you guys to do is basically upload this into, um, uh, excuse me, into Google, Google Colab first, right? So the lab is going to be under, let me see where the lab's under, um, not Python basics, but exploration, okay? So Python basics, as you can probably guess, right now, this is like some of the basic, you know, building blocks of Python, right? Which, you know, you guys already, you know, kind of done. I done, we done a graph library and I they're like, there's like some NumPy and Pandas, I'm leaving it to you uh, for you guys as an exercise. But let's look at some of the um, more sort of data science basic analytics. So those are under exploration. So under Google Colab, can I watch what I'm doing, guys? So right, I'm uploading a new notebook, browse, okay. Go to the main and then under exploration. Let's load number two, explore house sales. So I'll leave it up here so you guys can kind of, you know, look look at the path, right? Data science, GCP labs and exploration and uh, we're loading notebook number two. Okay, can you guys, um, can you guys get that going, please?
So we're going to explore how sales. I want to make sure everybody's up to this point. Yep. Yep, very good. All right, guys, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So now you can see the drill, right? So I import the libraries here, right? Um, one thing we wanna do, okay, so uh, since we are running on a cloud environment, we actually want to um, use uh, public cloud, you know, uh, so for example, you know, if you look at the data location, this one will not work, right? Because this is, this is trying to load a local, uh, local data, it won't work. So let's kind of comment this guy out and basically uncomment the next line. So what I'm doing is I'm actually loading this data from a public, uh, from a public cloud. Does that make sense? Okay, so, you know, this is a change I made. So you can sort of take a look at this one, please, right? So you're, because you, since we're running in the cloud, everything has to be, you know, there's no local, local file, right? I'm loading it from the public cloud. So please go to make the change. Okay. Sorry. All right, guys, all right? Are you all good here, right? So because, um, we want, and another thing, I don't know if you've noticed this, I'm actually loading this from our S3 bucket, right? So we are running on Google, but we are loading from Amazon, right? So it doesn't matter, it's all, it's all public cloud anyway, right? So this is from our public, um, uh, public bucket on S3. So as long as this data is accessible, that's all we are doing, right? So go and execute this code, please, okay? And you'll see, right? So here, here's what I'm reading. I'm saying, I'm saying PD. What does PD stand for? PD stands for pandas, right? So PD is like a shorthand for pandas. Pandas, I'm saying reads CSV file and just I'm pointing to a data location, that's it. And as you can see, it's reading a house data. You can see it's a house sales data, right? If you look at the columns, say sale price, you know, property type, bedrooms, bathrooms, you know, our usual, you know, usual house price data, right? So this is a real world data. Um, <clears throat> Um, I think when is it like, you can look at the zip code. I think it's like Washington state, I believe, um, right? So we have about 27,000 rows, not bad. Okay, this is working for everybody, right? We are loading some data, right? So the only change I made here was just, you know, I just uncommented this this one so I can load from the cloud, um, public cloud, right? That's it. Hey, uh, quick question. Sure. Just putting the variable name down house prices allows you to see it. Oh, here? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, yeah. So that's a, that's a good observation. So this is a little Jupyter trick. Uh, let me show you guys this here. <clears throat> so in Jupyter, right? Basically, Jupyter will print out <clears throat> whatever the last statement is. So in this case, one plus one is two, right? So it prints out two. However, if you assign one plus one to some other variable, it's not going to print it out. But if you mm -hmm. say A as a last variable, It'll print it out. See what I'm saying? So it's like a little trick in Jupyter. What we do is like, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to print out a, like a data frame or any variable, just leave it as a very last statement and Jupyter will print this out. Yeah, right, it's a little trick. So you don't have to explicitly say print. You know what I mean? That, that's probably what you're used to, right? Yeah. So, so print will always print out. But one of the neat tricks in Jupyter is like, if you leave the, you know, whatever you want to do it in the last thing, I need it, it's kind of printing it out. Pretty neat, right? <laughs> so yeah, save some great. typing, save some typing. And also let me show you this, right? Um, like if I just did a print, let me do a print here. And I mean, it does prints out, but no, it doesn't look as great as it did before. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> just plain text. So, and that's why, you know, we just, we just let Jupyter handle the printout because Jupyter knows this is the, oh, by the way, this is a data frame, right? When I, when I say, what do I mean data frame? 
you know, it has your rows and columns of data, right? So Jupyter will know this is a data frame and they will do a pretty nice job, you know, like putting like a little table and, you know, they will kind of highlight, you know, these rows. Yeah, anyway, so Jupyter does a much nice job as just simple print. So yeah, so this is a, this is a little trick, you know, everyone, everyone, you will see everyone using just, you know, whatever you want to print at the last. I have another quick question. Sure. So, if, you know, the existing code that's there that we loaded up the file data location, right? If we want to put an additional comment in there, how do we edit that code like that? Because I, I try to edit it and it thinks that I'm trying to run it every time. Oh, here you want to, you know, you want to edit this box? Yeah, just like put in a comment. Oh, yeah. So you just, you know, you to click on it. Um, and then, you know, just, you know, just, you know, and you just, you know, just, you know, you can say, you know, right? You can type anything you want. All right? Yeah. Oh, so, than me. so just, yeah, just click, click inside the box, like in the, I mean, in the cell, and then you can just, right. you know, you can, it's like a regular text box. You can edit anything you want. Okay. But only thing is, you know, Jupyter knows this is, the, this is the code. So that's why you see like a little, you know, the play button, right? Execute button. So every time, I think whenever you hit enter, it runs the code in the cell. Uh, so you edit, so the, what will run the code is like, if you do shift key and enter key, then it'll run the code. If you just simply hit enter, it'll give you the new line. See? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So just you know, just double check to make sure uh, something mm -hmm. something else is going on to execute. That'll that'll execute the code. Yeah. It's after lunch. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Like a like a little lunch coma. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah anyway. So, but usually, you know, you can just click on the play button and right, let's execute. Right. So. All right. Yes. So again, you can sort of, you know, you can, you can, you can uh, kind of execute along with me because it's kind of like a little Python exploration, right? We are looking at some real world data using Python, right? That's it. And the code is pretty complete. So I want you guys to, you know, so that's why, um, because if I ask you to write everything from scratch, it'll just take way too long. And, you know, it won't be, a, it won't be the best use of our class time, right? So, so most of the code is filled in. So I look for like, you know, some of the to-do items, you know, we have for you guys. And when you, when you can see this question mark, so I want you guys to kind of, you know, um, replace them. So here, what I want to ask is like, use the describe function and you, and you sort of see that, you know, right? You see the hint and you're gonna, yeah, you can sort of figure out what, what it is. So here I'm asking, okay, look at the data frame and ask Python to describe it for me. Execute this. And the output may seem a little, um, okay, one second, let me find out something. Um, There's something I've been meaning to do for a second. The display is a little hard to read. So give me one second. I'm gonna bring up a little code snippet. To, um, yeah. Okay, let me try this and I'll, I'll give you guys a... All right, let's try that. Oh, much better. All right, so here's a, like a little snippet because remember without this, you know, I don't know if you can notice this, like without this, you're kind of printing like, you know, in some scientific notation, it was kind of hard to read. So here's the code. You can actually, um, I'll put this in the, the lab section, right? Um, uh, how sales lab, basically step, what step are we at? Um, describe, yeah, just gonna put this one here, okay. So basically what this guy does, right? And this, this, is, the, this is sort of the, the new thing I just added. Basically what that does, right? It kind of shapes a number format. Again, just like a little flag, right? I mean, yeah, think nothing of it. It just, uh, so it just makes the display easy to read. All right, so now once I have this, so let's see what, what it's doing. So this clay function, what it does like goes by column by column and gives me like a little summary. So you can sort of see here, like first it counts how many rows there are. And then it gives me like summary like mean, right? Minimum, maximum. Right, 50 percentile. So it looks at the data and kind of, you know, if it's like a numbers data, it kind of gives you like the, you know, right, um, from the summary. So this is a nice way to look at things very quickly. So let's look at sale price. So what's the minimum sale price? You guys can see from here, 3,000, right? That's a min. What's the max? Uh, what is it? 11 million? Yeah, right, 11 million, right? Um, so, da, 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 da. Load. Let me try this one more time. There we go. Okay, even better. Put a comma in it, and then it's yeah. Um, okay. I wish someday this software would be smart enough 
to not to add point zero zeros in house prices. And <laughs> right. So it's basically treating this as like you know as a floating point number, right? Exactly. So right. So yeah. So and you can see like it's basically you know I mean because some of them are like you know like you're right sale price and it's very hard to you know you don't think that people are going to be putting cents in the sale price, but it's basically treating them as like a floating point and that's why that's right. Yeah. All right. So all right. So max house price we are thinking is eleven million. Okay. Good. Okay. So let's have a number of bedrooms here. Um, so minimum number of, again, look at the minimum, right? Minimum number of bedrooms is zero. Do you guys think it's valid? Zero bedrooms? Maybe it's a plot of land or something. 3,000 anyways, it looks weird. No, no, oh, sorry, uh, number of bedrooms, number of bedrooms, right? Look at the number of bedrooms here. So minimum number of bedrooms is zero. Do you guys think that's an error or you know that's a valid data? Studio. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the context. So the sale price of 3000 with a bedroom of zero, it seems like this is some outlier data. Who knows what it is? Oh, okay. So, okay. so actually, yeah, one thing I need to make sure is these are not from the same record, right? So this is like per column stats. So, oh. so for example, right. So yeah, don't think this 3000 is zero. Like this is like the minimum of, you know, it, you have to read like per column. There's no relation, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so right now, yeah, so do, yeah, don't correlate this 3000 with the zero. So just, this is just, you know, it just went through all the bedroom data and the number of bedrooms is zero is the minimum. Uh, somebody said something like a studio, right? So it could be a studio bedroom, you know, then, you know, it could be zero, right? Okay, let's say how many max bedrooms we have. <laughs> 33 bedrooms, right? There you go, right? So there's a house with 33 bedrooms. Um, so you can, as you can see, right? So, so the, the reason I sort of look at this data, right? The describe function is this one is great because in one snapshot, I have a pretty good feel for the data. You can see, right? I can sort of see, okay, hey, there's like a 33 bedroom house. So obviously it's an outlier, right? So we know this data has outlier data, okay? So again, that's why the describe function is you know, really, really great because in one, one snapshot, it gives you a pretty good idea of the data. So a lot of the data scientists look at describe and they look at the function and say, okay, say, do we, do we see any outliers? We definitely have outliers, right? So, good guys. Okay. Now, if you want to um, just look at, you know, so describe function goes through all the columns. If you just want one column, you simply give the column name. So okay, let's say I want like just to, you know, look at the sale price, sure, right? So describe, so you can see how I'm putting a sale price in here, right? And the describe will just analyze that one column. And this is handy because sometimes you will have lots and lots of columns, like you have data and you will have you know, hundreds of columns, <laughs> right? So you don't want to, you know, and most likely you probably are not interested in hundreds of columns either. So you actually kind of, you know, say, hey, you know what, just show me, you know, these columns all that I'm interested in. So then you can, you can narrow it down. All right, guys, so let's do some basic um, analytics. So what I want to do is I want to, find out how many bedrooms per, you know, like one bedroom, how many one bedrooms, how many two bedrooms were sold. So we are gonna group by bedrooms attribute, just like think like SQL, right? And I'm gonna put a, put a quick report. So you can see here, right? So bedrooms, I'm grouped by bedrooms. So you can see here zero bedrooms, I sold 12, one bedroom, 164, right? All that. Okay, so you can see three bedrooms like the, you know, the best seller, right? Sold 12,000. And then followed by four bedrooms and so on. So, you know, kind of you know confirms our um, you know our usual understanding. And then also you know this 33 bedroom, there's only one house, <laughs> and there's the other one with 13 bedrooms. All right. So this way, when you guys do this basic stats, you can quickly see what we have. Right. So basically, we are sort of trying to understand the data. Right. I want to kind of pause here for a minute so we can all catch up at, up to this point. So we are doing a bedroom report. So here's the change I made. Right. Bedrooms. So the default return on the group by is count, right? That's what. Right. So yeah. So basically, exactly. So, <clears throat> so I'm kind of I'm, uh, yeah. That's a good observation. So I'm kind of doing like group by, and then also I'm doing size. So I'm kind of chaining these functions, right? Exactly. So what it gives me is like a count per per bedroom count. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, these are some basic you know pandas thing, right? We are kind of I'm just you know just expo you know exposing them to you guys. Uh, just so you are kind of like, a, and also I want to show you some real world data, not some, you know, 
and also made up data. So this way we get an idea of how to analyze real world data, right? So, all right, so can I pause here for a, for a few seconds so we can all catch up. <clears throat> All right, have you all good here? Yep. Okay. And then out here, so here's some percentiles I'm calculating. For example, I want to calculate sort of the, you know, so some of the percentiles like 25 percentile, 50 percentile, 90 percentile, 95 percentile sale price, right? So let me kind of print this out. And, you know, here's a display, right? So basically it says, right, um, um, Midpoint of house sales, like 50 percent is like a median, right? So median house in this area sold for like 425,000. Because that's a 50 percent remember? And then you can also make an argument, 90 percent of the houses in this neighborhood sold for less than 820,000, right? And then 95 percent of the houses sold for less than 1 million. So that's how you sort of interpret the results, right? So you can sort of quickly say, okay, hey, somebody asks you, okay, hey, I'm, I'm trying to buy a house in the this, in this, in this zip code what's sort of the median price? Median price is 50% down. And what's sort of the 90% of the house sell for? You know, you can say, you know, 90% of the house, you know, sell like 820,000 or under. Yep. All right, I guess execute that. Again, you know, this one, pretty, we can execute pretty much. Sort of we are interpreting the results, right? And as you can see, right, when we let Jupiter print out the details, it's kind of a little nicer, right? Print to the table, pretty nice. All right, guys, and finally, we are going to use correlation because you know you guys actually did the correlation just now. So you now what I'm going to comment this out for now. Actually, I'm going to just execute this one for now. The correlation function is very simple. It's simply core, right? C O R R. This is what I did. Execute this. Okay. So again, this this is what I did in this function correlation, right? I'm going to give you guys a second to look at the correlation matrix and tell me um, which attribute correlates highly with the sale price. So here's sale price, right? Look at that, look at all the attributes and numbers. Which attribute do you guys think highly correlates with the sale price or highly influence the sale price? Square footage total living. Yeah, it looks like it, right? That's about 68%. Remember, remember these are all normalized between minus one and plus one, right? So we are looking for something as close to plus one as possible. And by the way, all the right, all the all the diagonals are one, right? As we expect. Okay. So say I'm looking for sale price, which influence the sale price. So, so see here, right? Square foot living in the size of the house kind of seems to influence sale price 68% of the time. Number of bedrooms, you know, about just barely 50%. Interesting, right? So this is how you know we put everything sort of we sort of did uh, in practice. Yeah. All right, I guess I'll do the coalition matrix. And what else? Um, by the way, zip code, even though it's a number, you know what I mean? I mean, in this case, you know, we, we should ignore zip code because it's not a real number, right? So he has, you know, we're, you know look, look at the number, but it's not. So <coughs> I wouldn't worry about zip code. Just look at sale price and see, right? Which ones influence sale price more. It's interesting. How, do, how did your output become two decimals when I ran the same, uh, get, you know, out to six, six decimals? Is there a rounding in there going on? So? Oh yeah, so I, I think, yeah. So I put in like a little extra code here to make it like, so here's the, uh, right? So if you look at the, uh, look at the class notes, uh, the, you know, so this, this see what's I, I have highlighted. If you uh -huh. put this on top of it, that kind of shapes the output, right? I know uh -huh. otherwise you get this sort of the scientific notation, right? Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, exactly, which is, which is not easy to, easy to read.
All right. All right. So let me show the code again. So again, we, the final thing we did, guys, is the um, correlation matrix. Right. Again, I'll, I'll upload the code. Don't worry. I'll upload the solution file for this. So you'll have a full solution file. Here's a collision matrix. Right. So. Leave this up for a second. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> Any questions on this one again? Um, the you know again so we are using the pandas library pandas uh, you know like we look at the pandas library pandas is a pretty big library and yeah, i'll put the link here um for you guys so anytime we actually use data analysis in python pandas is the go-to library right because um, um it can it can actually analyze you know things like Excel spreadsheets, CSV data very very easily, right? So, oh, interesting. This is a it's fun to base Zuckerberg, I guess. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. So that's that. What else I want to highlight here? Any questions on this one, guys? Again, it's a very quick tour of you know kind of you know you're loading real world data. And then using pandas to do some basic analytics, right? Things like, you know, what do the houses look like? You know, what are the, you know, what kind of houses are selling, right? What's the average price? Things like that. All right, guys, good. Any other questions on this one? So basically we are doing a, um, a Python in Google. So again, there are two choices basically, right? <clears throat> we are using the same free version, which is Colab. Uh, they have a paid version called Data Lab. <clears throat> so even now, you know, they are doing Colab as a premium version as well. So, right, so they're kind of, you know, basically, so what is, what is what are all these? These are basically pre-made uh, Python environments that you can run your Python code on, right? That, that's the idea. Yep. Any other question on this one, guys? So what does, what does it mean by premium Python environment? So premium basically meaning, you know, you pretty much, you know, the free version is they, they limit how much you get, how much CPU and uh, memory you can get, right? Uh, so you can sort of, you, know, you can see here. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, that is still pretty generous for free version. Yeah. But the premium version is, you know, you can choose how much, you know, whatever you, you like. So and, the, the premium is only the higher capacity or anything else that they offer? And also things like, you know, um, they give you like other things like um, um, your code, you know, so right now, you know, your code didn't disconnect as quickly, you know what I mean? Uh, things like that. Yeah. So the premium is pretty new uh, for Colab. So I'm still sort of looking at, you know, what are the new features? But one thing is like, you can choose your on time and also things like you can, you know, uh, they will not disconnect you after like 30 minutes or something like that. Yeah. So how do you go to premium version? Uh, go call our premium. So, um, right. Yeah. Call our premium. <clears throat> yeah. So it's basically you need to kind of, you know, um, uh, right. So, um, yeah. Okay. Basically, it's basically part of your Google account, right? Yeah. Call a pro, that's what they call it. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so you can sort of see it, right? You know, fast, you know, fast, you know, basically, you know, faster GPUs, faster memory, more, more runtime. So, right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah. So, 10 bucks a month um, if you are really, really into this. And I, I know a few people who already have a subscription for this because 
uh, they use GPUs, right, for their work. Um, so you can see here, right, right. So the free version has sort of the slowest GPUs, um, but the premium one, you, you get like the latest ones, so. All right, guys, so let's see what we have here. Next section, we are gonna jump into Spark. All right. So, so kind of the progress we have been going is like this, right? So this is the outline for the class. Um, we did the computer engine yesterday, storage, our data studio, all of this was covered yesterday. So today we started with BigQuery, right? And also we looked at Python, how to run Python code in Google. Um, and then we are going to look at sort of big data. How do you do big data? And for this, um, I mean, BigQuery can do quite a bit, but it's still SQL, right? Because, you know, there's only so much you can do in SQL. What if you have some really custom code you want to process large data sets? That's where we are going to come to Spark. So I sent you guys a Spark slides um, uh, this afternoon. So slide number 12 and 13 are Spark. Right. Um, what else I have to see here? Hi, I have a question uh, yep. regarding sure. the collab uh, before uh -huh. we move on. So, yeah. can you show, like, say for example, we want to run um, or do some visualize some uh, data on a collab notebook, uh, and we've already loaded the data into our Google Storage bucket. Uh -huh. Can we? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good point. Yeah. So, what you will do here is. Very good question, yeah. So we'll actually load the data like this, right? So you know how we, you know, see, just change the location to data login. So for example, so let, let me see if we can go here. Where's my Google Cloud account? Is it here? Ah. Cloud.google.com. One second. Get there. So I just want to replace the file, the, the URL, right? So here you want to go to um, storage, right? So let's say here's my bucket. Okay. So let's say flights data. Say look at a file. See the HTTPS URL? Right. right. Just plug it in. That's it. Okay. Yeah. But like also you can, like the, the times that I tried to do uh, some data science projects on Google Colab, mm -hmm. I had to end up uh, like mounting Google Drive and making it locally accessible. And it was fairly convoluted and was confusing. Right. So, okay. So here's the thing. Like there are some limitations, for example, let me show you guys here, not this. Right. So, yeah. So I think you're talking about this, right? You're going to mount yeah. drive and all yeah, this stuff. Yeah. Um, here's the thing. If your code does not depend on external module, like let's say, for example, if you're loading libraries, like for example, you have some, you know, let's say you wrote some function you want to load in, you know, in your notebook, then you can have to go through this stance, right? You have to mount this drive and all that. But your notebook is self-contained, meaning like, you know, you're just using standard, standard functions. Like here, we're using, you know, pretty much Pandas specific, right? And I'm not loading any, any other modules, then you're okay. Then you don't need to sort of do the mount. All, all it needs is your data should be accessible to Google Cloud. So basically, you know, here, you know, I mean, right, just here's my URL, right, that's it, right? Or you, you can even sometimes use the actual GS URL too, right? You can even say the, um, right, copy this guy. Yeah, because if you're running on Colab, you can readily actually access um, the Google, you know, Google URL, right? So yeah, so that's it. So if you're reading from bucket, this is all you had to do. The problem you're describing is basically, I, mean, so I think what I'm guessing is what, what you kind of try to do is like you probably, let's say you're sort of, you know, you're sort of, you know, doing some, you know, something like import my custom module, something like this, right? If you did this, then yeah, you had to kind of, you know, because remember this is running in the cloud environment, right? Because they don't have your custom code. Right, so, so we have to upload the script on. Right, <laughs> right, right exactly. Kind of, yeah. So yeah, that's a kind of a pain point. I know, yeah, yeah because when we try to do this, like, yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a pain to kind of you know load custom modules. Um, so usually, what we do is there are two. You can do two things, right? You can actually load the module um, using pip, like you know, for example, you know, like for example, you can say something like you know, pip install my module, right? Uh, so this way, it'll actually install only on your runtime, and then you can use it, 
right? Yeah, so yeah, this, uh, this is a little bit of a pain point right now. I, I, I completely understand. Uh, but if your notebook is self-contained, then you know, this, you know, this is pretty, pretty painless. Right, but it has to be in PIP. Otherwise, you have to go through a lot of pain. Like if it's like a helper function I've written to build a Keras right. model or something, then yes. for that, it has to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's so, why I struggle with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I trust me. I, I, I mean, the, the second you said it, I immediately knew what the problem was because, you know, we went through this too. So the way we kind of fix this is basically um, we would have our own uh, like a pip server, right? Can I mean write a pip in a module, right? And you know, we have a private, private um, pip module, um, pip, uh, what am I saying? Package, package server, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, and then we just put, you know, push it out package. And because these are like, you know, pretty standard module, you know, we will write and we'll install from there. Yeah, it's a kind of a pain. I, 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 I completely get it. But uh, so I hope they do. I mean, I don't know why they have, really haven't thought through this one because it's anybody who's doing serious work, you are going to have custom modules, right? Um, so yeah, uh, so hopefully, you know, they will address this soon, I'm hoping. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. The, uh, the other option is basically like what you said, like you mount the drive and then copy the module and yeah, you know, you have to go through all the dance, right? Yeah. Yeah, but that also depends on how much space you have in your personal right. Google Drive, which... Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, this is another hack you can do, right? So let me see if I can do this, um, right? Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this one, but kind of like, you know, yeah. So, if you publish your module somewhere else, you can actually download the, you know, download the, download the module, right? I guess I, so yeah, I'm sort of saving and saving the module, right? So now you know, right. so refresh okay. this, right? It's actually here. Uh, then you can sort of, you know, you can sort of download the module and kind of load the module. Now it's like a local file. Right. It's a hack, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not yeah. proud of this, but it's a hack. <laughs> but it's so not. we can technically upload Python scripts to a Google storage bucket and download it from there, just like yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. makes sense. Anyway, 